Um, I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of May 22nd, 2024. Um, we have meeting this afternoon and this morning. This morning's agenda has two presentations, amendment to One Care's fiscal year 24 budget and a potential vote, and then fiscal year 25 One Care budget guidance, a staff presentation and a potential vote. And those will be presented by uh, staff attorney Mark Hengstler and Michelle Sawyer, our health policy project director. Um, first, I'll turn to the meeting minutes from May 15th, and I will move for approval of the meeting minutes. A second. All those in favor say aye. 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 The minutes are unanimously approved. Um, Ms. Barrett will provide the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have a new public comment period. Um, yesterday, we had a hearing on UVMMC's CON for an outpatient surgery center. We are accepting public comments until noon um, of May 30th of 2024. In addition, we have another open public comment period for the reporting manual on our all payer claims database, which is called vCures. And we are accepting those comments by May 31st. We also have two ongoing public comment periods on the AHEAD model, the potential next model for um, Vermont to participate in with CMMI. Uh, please share any of your comments regarding that. We share those comments with our colleagues at AHS and also an ongoing public comment period on the hospital sustainability work per Act 167 that the Green Mountain Care Board is leading. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, Mr. Hengsler, do you wanna provide the presentation on an amendment to One Care's 24 budget order? Yeah, happy to do so. Let me just pull up a couple of quick slides. This won't be long. All right, that should be showing. Um, so I'm just going to tear through a few brief slides just to give us an overview of what we're doing this morning. Um, and I'll explain in here uh, how I think it would make the most sense to to move through this this discussion after the slides wrap up. Um, so we're looking today at um, potential amendments to the One Care Vermont FY24 budget order. Um, a little bit of background on where this is coming from. In the uh, budget order from this year, the last condition, condition 19, states that after notice and an opportunity to be heard, the GMCB may make such further orders as are necessary to carry out the purposes of this order and 18 VSA section 9382. Um, on May 8th, the board moved to consider doing this uh, to consider two potential additions to the budget order. Uh, the first would require one care to prospectively include in its hospital provider contracts a method for tracking population health investments for primary care. And the second would track and report require one care to track and report prospectively on its administrative expenses by function or by program. Um, one care has not provided a written response yet to these motions, but it uh, may respond at today's meeting uh, if a vote happens today prior to doing so, or uh, if a vote happens next week, which is also fine, um, then one care would have additional time as well. Um, again, condition 19 states that um, uh, one care is entitled to an opportunity to be heard on this issue um, and requires that any further orders that are included in the FY24 budget order um, uh, be necessary to carry out the purposes of the order and statute. Um, so with that in mind, I just want to go over what the statute and order have as written so that we can kind of couch ourselves in in where we're at and and why the board might want to act on two matters here. So starting with the first item, which is investments to strengthen primary care. Um, Here's what the statute says. Uh, 18 VSA 9382B1G states that the board shall review and consider the extent to which the ACO provides incentives for systemic healthcare investments to strengthen primary care, including providing resources to expand capacity in existing primary care practices. 
Uh, in the budget order on page 34, uh, the board uh, made two findings. The first was that the level of support for primary care resources proposed in One Care's budget is vital to the goals of strengthening primary care. Um, and second, that One Care had declined to provide requested information about how it ensures primary care earned incentive dollars are flowing to these providers uh, and or are being invested into primary care transformation efforts. So with those findings in mind, what the board did in the FY24 budget order was to require One Care to provide the board verification that all One Care population health payments presented by One Care in its budget uh, uh, as incentives that support primary care were actually reaching primary care providers. That was the language of uh, condition 17. In February, One Care wrote to the board and explained that it wouldn't be providing this verification. It wrote that directing participating providers to expend funds in the manner contemplated by the verification or the oath is not something that the One Care Board of Managers has felt is necessary or advisable and is not a current contractual obligation. Uh, so that's where we stood when we uh, when the board met um, on on the eighth. Um, the uh, idea at this point is that the board could uh, in include a new condition um, uh, to try to get at this issue that it it initially tried with condition seventeen. And I, I have two ways of doing this here. Um, I, we can chat more about these, but I, I'll just explain kind of what these two different ways of doing this would would basically look like. Um, so starting point for for template motion language, the board could move to amend the One Care Vermont budget order by ordering One Care to prospectively include in its contracts with hospital providers, first option, a method of tracking population health payments to ensure those payments strengthen the provision of primary care. So the idea here is the board would direct One Care to include in contracts, prospectively, uh, some method of tracking how this money is uh, uh, making it to uh, to uh, primary care uh, uh, projects uh, within the hospital network. Um, if the language was as simple as this, it would give one care and hospital providers a chance to kind of figure out that method amongst themselves. Um, the board could obviously be, be more directive in that, but that would be the first option would be to ask for some method of tracking this. So hospitals are are tracking the, these items uh, 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 basically um, uh, through con con contract with one care. The second option, um, which is a little bit more of a light touch is that the board could amend the budget order by ordering one care to prospectively include in its contracts uh, language stating that the hospital shall use all funds received from one care for primary care investment to enhance primary care initiatives which otherwise would not be funded to the same extent so the idea here is uh, kind of as light a touch as possible one care would be required to have in its contracts with hospital providers language that states that hospitals are going to use the money as intended. That's what that, that would just be the language. It'd be part of the the um, contract language that that hospital providers and one care would enter into. Um, what the board could then do is, to the extent that it wants reporting or tracking of this information from hospital providers, it could really deal with that on the hospital budget side of its work. Um, in other words, rather than using one care as a means of trying to get this information, um, it could just have require one care to have in its contracts this this language that that. Uh, Hospital providers are going to use the money as intended, and then any reporting efforts that we want to deal with could happen in the hospital budget process. Um, so those are two two options for for dealing with that item. Um, I'll move ahead now to the administrative budget by function, which is the second uh, the second item. So eighteen VSA ninety three eighty two B one D states that the board shall review and consider the character, competence, fiscal responsibility, and soundness of the ACO and its principles. Um, a little history here. In 2021, the board contracted with Demore Health Advisors, LLC, to get some um, recommendations for how the board could regulate and work with OneCare to improve OneCare's operations. 
there's a big list of recommendations from Demore Health, but one of those recommendations was that One Care should integrate a program evaluation process into its annual strategic and operational planning processes to measure program effectiveness and to identify programs for modification or elimination based on data and actual program effectiveness. Um, that that was that was one of the recommendations, and the board, in its uh, budget order for fiscal year twenty four, tried to get at this um, in a relatively simple way. So what the board did was it said, okay, um, when One Care submits its revised budget, it's going to use a template provided by GMCB staff, and then the template the GMCB staff created. Uh, which was the, the FY24 revised budget workbook, included a template for reporting One Care's administrative budget by function. The idea was that One Care would uh, track its administrative budget by function, it would report on those figures in the revised budget, and then the board could see um, how much it cost for One Care to uh, fund each of its programs or functions. In February, One Care wrote to the board and explained that it doesn't track its administrative expenses in this manner, and so would not complete the template as requested. Um, so we, we, we didn't get this back when we uh, got the revised budget submission. So some template language, if the board wants to try to deal with this and, and get what it requested in, um, you know, through condition nine of the budget order, the board could move to amend the One Care Vermont budget order by ordering One Care to track, starting July 1st, its administrative and operational expenses by function, such that One Care and the board can sufficiently identify the administrative and operational expenses of various One Care programs. One Care shall track these expenses using the functions outlined in the FY25 budget guidance workbook, which shall report on the FY24 actuals in its FY25 budget submission. So a few quick notes here. Um, the template motion language uh, states that this would start on July 1st, uh, not because we've talked with One Care and have decided and, and have gotten confirmation that this is the, the uh, a feasible date from them, um, but it states that because uh, July through the October submission would give the board roughly a quarter of, of actual data um, if, if this was the deadline. So just from a data perspective, starting July would give us three months, which is a pretty, you know, it's kind of the best that we could imagine doing at this point, as far as I can tell. Um, one care might have have uh, some some reasons that this wouldn't work. We'd be happy to hear those. Um, the the idea here is that if One Care is reporting on some actuals for FY24 when it submits its FY25 budget, the board will have the board and One Care will have really a better way of actually evaluating the budgeted um, administrative costs by function for FY25. So it would have been better to have this data going back earlier into 2024. We are not asking One Care in this template motion language to go back retroactively and try to get this data. That doesn't really make sense uh, if the goal is to get, um, you know, for example, uh, administrative uh, time uh, records of how, how time at the staff level at One Care is being used. Um, uh, so the language here is just intended to prospectively give us something for FY24 uh, that we can look at for FY25 budget submission. Um, so with that, um, you know, that's that's the, the template motion language for, for item one and item two. Um, I'm going to take this off of the screen for a moment, um, and I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Um, One Care uh, certainly uh, has the right to share any thoughts about this. Um, and I think that one option is One Care could just do that first as a starting point, and then we could turn to board questions. Or if you prefer, we could do board questions first and then and then turn it to One Care. I think either would work. Um, thank you very much, Mark. That was helpful and a really good history of that. So thank you. Um, I, I'm happy to hear from uh, One Care folks. I see a couple are here. Um, it might inform board members a little bit better if we hear from One Care first, if they were interested in doing so. Um, and sorry, and Mr. Hengsler, one other question. You said we don't have to vote on this today. Is that right? 
Yeah, so we're noticed for a potential vote today and a potential vote for next week. Um, so there's there's flexibility in the schedule to to do this either way. Okay, great. So um, just to the one care folks that are here, if if you want to comment now, please do. If you want to take a couple days and send in a written public comment or something, that's fine since we don't have to vote today and you don't have to comment if you don't want to. So I'll turn it over if you'd like to, but no, no pressure either way. Mr. Boris, how are you? Go, go ahead. I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm, I'm really um, well, thank uh, you. Great. Uh, I think I'll start with the first one and then kind of pause and get to the, the second one. Mark, thank you for that um, explanation. I think that was really fair and I, I appreciate it. Regarding, um, you know, the, the idea of putting into contract some sort of a tracking methodology prospectively, uh, understand that, understand where it's coming from. Um, I I just want to kind of echo the the concept of asking for this information in the hospital uh, process. I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Just for my work with the hospitals, I think they're all doing really amazing things in this space and investing wisely in their care delivery and expanding what is defined as primary care. And I think that their explanations of what they're doing in their own organizations will be more valuable than any kind of tracking that we can supply. I think we could help get some sort of a, you know, here's a page of numbers and, you know, maybe an attestation, but I think the story is more important uh, to really show the work that we're doing together with our provider partners. So just want to really kind of echo, I think that that would be a, a really effective way to understand how the healthcare system is evolving with the resources, many of which come from the hospitals themselves are being put to good use. Thank you. Um, Mr. Berman. Hi, Abe Berman, CEO of One Care Vermont. <clears throat> um, yeah, just adding on to what Tom stated, um, appreciate the board considering some of the feedback we've provided. I think doing this on a prospective basis in our contracts uh, makes sense. Um, I think Mark did a nice job outlining um, a possible process you could take to do that. Um, I agree with Tom that it it makes a lot of sense to have it come from the hospitals. I, I don't think you'll have any resistance from the hospitals in describing how they use those funds. I think they do a good job tracking them as well. Um, but I do agree um, with that second approach that it should largely be part of the hospital regulation process for the Green Mountain Care Board to get that information. The one thing I did want to comment on is um, there's a subtle shift in language between what was in last year's budget orders to what's here and that the dollars may not flow directly to a primary care provider. Um, they may be in support of primary care the way these um, organizations are using the funds. And I think that's expressed in the latter language, but wasn't always consistently expressed. So I just want to be clear in support of primary care doesn't necessarily mean it goes into the salary of a primary care provider. There's a lot of other things that I think can happen with that funding. Um, that are really valuable to support primary care. Thank you. Um, Mr. Perry. Yeah, I think on that issue, I agree with what Tom and, and Abe both said. Um, and Mr. Chair, you offered uh, an opportunity for us to uh, maybe be able to have a couple of days to provide a written response. I think from a legal perspective, we'd want to run through our contractual obligations that we have to our payers and make sure that whatever gets implemented and, and we agree works um, doesn't violate those or, or or put us at cross purposes with some of what those say. And we're going to need some time to to put that together to make sure that that everything is sound. Okay, great. Um, I think that's prudent and I don't we don't have a pressure to vote today, so I'm happy to put off the vote so that you can have a chance to do that. And I was reminded while we we're speaking to. Identify people if they're associated with a regulated entity and just so for the record and others, um, Mr. Perry is, um, I believe, the general counsel at one care um, and Mr. Boris is the CFO, I believe. Great. OK, that's correct. Thank Any board. 
Thanks. Any any board member comments or discussion? I was wondering if and maybe th this is something we would do with the template and the 25 guidance, but in terms of the admin function question, if we're going to discuss that today, um, I had some questions about the categories and the template. Um, I don't know if you want to do that in this part or the next part, but they're linked to me in my mind in terms of the modification of the fiscal year 24 budget around budget by function. Yeah, same. Um, we can. Why don't we wait and do the next part since they are kind of related and it might be better to have the whole set of information. Um, Miss Mr. Boris. Sorry, I might be raising my hand at the wrong moment, so I apologize if that's the case, but I do have a couple comments about the administrative budget by function and the language here. So if it's appropriate, happy to make them now. If you'd like me to pause, that's fine too. No, please go ahead. All right. Um, so this, this one's admittedly piddly, but I still feel obligated to say it. On slide five, it says we would not complete this template as requested. I think the a more correct way of stating that is to say we couldn't. We just did not have historical data, so it's not an unwillingness. It's just an inability to do that retrospectively. Um, on the uh, the time tracking or the budget by by function, it, it's largely a time tracking exercise for staff. So I've you know kind of two thoughts: one that's um, kind of logistical, and one that's conceptual, I suppose. One is around timing. We build our budget in largely in July and August. And then it goes through our board for a couple different passes. We typically do a preliminary look in in August, and then a final look in September. And then their approval, you know, paves the way for us to submit all the documents in uh, on October first on a regularly scheduled timeline. So all this is to say, our our budget will be underway and being built up over the next couple of months. So if we were to do a, you know, start a time tracking process with all One Care staff. It's going to be much less than a full quarter of data that we'd be able to capture. We're, we're really talking a couple of weeks, maybe a month of reliable data. Um, but the bigger issue is actually that our work really flows on an annual cycle. Um, this is what I say to new people that are hired into one care. You really won't understand the business until we've traveled around the sun one full time because there's certain bodies of work that you'll that will happen heavily in the fall and you really won't touch them uh, until you get to the next fall and have a chance to do it again. So if we do a short term time study, I think it will be an incomplete picture of the work that we do. And, you know, for example, the budget build is very heavy in the summer. It's not something that we engage in heavily you know, thereafter. We go through the, the testimony and all that, but the actual budget build process is periodic. And, um, you know, a lot of the other work that is linked back to something like the contracting process for you know, the longitudinal care program, for example, it's very intensive for a period of time. And then once we get into kind of the, the ordinary operations of that initiative, it's could be much quieter. So all this is to say is to get a really accurate picture of One Care's work and how the different administrative functions support all these initiatives that we run and fulfilling our contractual obligations, a longer term time tracking initiative is, is strongly recommended from a, a technical or logistical standpoint, which leads to my second kind of conceptual uh, thought here is to do this time tracking in a reliable way that we would feel good about, like I can endorse it in a budget, and I think it would be useful to you as a regulator, it's asking our staff to track their time for a full year. And that's really penalizing to them. They're, they come to work to do all these altruistic things to try and help the, the healthcare system as much as we can with the few resources that we have. And I think the burden on them to do that would just be really disheartening. And I'd like to see us try to work together to figure out a different way to meet this objective so that you have what you need and we don't ask our staff to track at a very microscopic level with each of these little categories, how they're spending their days. Um, you know, it's tough enough to work at One Care, and I think that this would be a really hard thing for the staff to deal with. I have one question, if you don't mind um, engaging on this a little bit. So I, I think the purpose, I mean, I appreciate those points um, and I 
I'm a practicing lawyer too. And I, when I do that kind of work, I've got six minute increments I got to live with and describe every phone call and every email I write. And it is, it is not the favorite part of my, my chosen profession. So I appreciate the challenge of that. And it's not a lot of fun. Um, but what we're trying to get at is, you know, the one care budget has been 13 to 15 million ish for, for several years. And there's, a concern, at least on the board side, that maybe not all that expenditure is having the impact we want. And so we don't want to authorize spending of state money, ultimately likely commercial money, on programs that might not be having the return we hope. And I fully recognize some of them are very, very difficult to even try to measure, as you know from our effort at the um, ROI analysis. So how would you propose we best get at understanding what costs are not having a positive impact on Vermont quality, access, or, or costs? Sure, I can take a stab. First, we're privately funded by hospitals and, um, you know, money is fungible. It's so it's, it's just technically incorrect to say that we're state funded. Don't want to get in that argument right now, but um, we are privately funded. The, I think, to get at that, it's a zoom out. Um, the work that we do is highly matrixed within our organization, and everything that we do is in spirit of just ensuring that we can function. All of our work is is contractually bound. We have contracts with payers, we have contracts with providers, and we just need to fulfill all those expectations. Or you know, we get dinged in our financial statement audit, or our customers, the providers, won't sign up anymore. So it's a constant assessment that we make internally with our board and governance. Do we have the right resources to fulfill all the expectations of those contracts and ensure that we can operate uh, in a reasonable way and in a responsible way? We deal with a lot of money, a lot of financial risk, and we have to have resources to do that appropriately. Um, otherwise, I, I think it would be irresponsible of, of us to offer these risk-based programs without enough administrative support for the provider network. So I, I think the answer is actually a zoom out question of asking whether or not there's a belief that ACOs are a, a positive influence on the healthcare system. And, you know, the budget that we build is designed to support the work we have in front of us. And, you know, you can't just cut off a, a, an arm of it and expect the whole thing to keep working. I, I can promise you that. Um, but I believe, and I think our entire executive team and our staff all believe that the work that we are doing is beneficial to the parties we have business with, which is payers and providers, and that that work will benefit the healthcare system broadly, which affects us all in a, in a really positive way. Measuring that, admittedly, really difficult to do. I mean, it's hard to, I don't know which Vermonters are specifically referenced in some of the documents, but really we work to serve our providers so that they can do better serving their customers. And I, I think to answer that question, it's actually let's zoom out and talk about ACOs and what we can do as a system rather than digging in to segment the business and cut it into different parts and seeing which ones can be you know, lobbed off. Yeah, and just on your first comment, privately funded, what I was referring to was really more most of the money, if not all of it at this point, comes from hospital dues. And hospitals tell us that Medicare and Medicaid don't pay enough and all the excess money comes from commercial. And so when I said Vermonters money, I meant either through taxes or commercial health insurance through the hospitals funds one care. Um, I get that it's privately funded, but it's public money that goes to a nonprofit that then goes to one care. Um, OK, well, I appreciate those comments and thoughts. Um, any board member comments or thoughts at this time or we can take it up in the next part? Right. I just Great. have. I just thank have you. One. And um, if if you have, I was going to say, if you if you have stuff that you want to put in on this, we I don't think we need to vote on this today either. So if you wanted to add this to any sort of letter to provide the board more feedback on this point, certainly open to it. Or go ahead, but Dr. Bergman. Yeah, I just I I think that what I'm struggling with is that I think that you're suggesting that our trying to understand time allocation is too granular. We need to step back and look at what do we what are ACOs for? You know, let's have that discussion. I think we're actually somewhere in the middle. We're trying to figure out 
what are the relative benefits of the various programs within the ACO, not with an intention to cut an arm or a leg off, but to figure out what's working well to try to emphasize for future projects within Vermont and what does it cost to run those projects? And, you know, the possibility that one care is in a very different configuration in a couple of years, and some of those projects may need to be taken over by other entities in one shape or form. So yes, I think we would, you know, you suggest you 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 offered, um, you know, to try to have a conversation, try to figure out how we can get to that, and I think that's what we're trying to get to, and I think we've been trying to get to that for a while. So, if you have ideas about how we can think about the various components of the organization, where where they could live in the future, what might be okay to sunset, what would be great to continue, and what are the relative benefits of those things, because, you know, the all pair model is not going to continue in its current form. One care is going to look different. And, and there are, you know, there's things that I think we hear over and over again, we want to make sure survive. So I think that's the intent of this. It's not, you know, it's not intended to, to burden the staff of one care who I'm, I, I'm sure go to work every day trying to make healthcare in Vermont better for everybody. I truly believe that. I think, you know, that is, that is the goal, but it's it's for us to try to understand. And if you can help inform us in this in a different way that satisfies, I think our try understand our, our desire to understand what is working and what should we try to continue. Um, I'm open to other approaches, but but to just simply say we need to look back at the very very broad thing, I, I think gets it misses. I think where the board has been trying to to get to over the last few years. I can just actually add a little bit to that. It might be helpful in the next week. I know you're going to be preparing some comments, um, you know, with re reference to these motions. It might be helpful uh, to hear from One Care about the categories that have been proposed to do the tracking and, you know, balancing the administrative burden of doing that time tracking against what the board is trying to seek, which is a better understanding of resource allocation. I'm wondering if part of your comments might be uh, a, a look at those categories and trying to balance that and give us some suggestions for other categories or another way to think about um, how time, you know, and other resources are spent across the programs to get at closer to the program evaluation that, you know, I think people have been seeking. So I just would ask for that if you have um, some suggestions. Mr. Berman. That's uh, really helpful, Dr. Merman and, and Member Holmes um, context, and I think we can do that in written feedback. Just, just a little bit of sort of nuance to it. So for example, we spend a couple million dollars of our budget on data informatics. Some of that is gonna be allocated to each one of the projects that are on that list. But in fact, we can't take out a piece of that $2 million because we stopped doing that project. We have to keep the data secure and we have to keep access to it to do a lot of that work. So it's sort of like a, a fixed component that's not able to be scalable necessarily to that work. So I think what we can provide in our response is that there are some things that are like that, where in order to operate an ACO, you have to keep data secure. You have to have a platform to issue data on it. Now, you could argue we don't have the right platform, it's right there at cost, but the way we are right now, we couldn't necessarily scale that back easily. But we can point out to you like, hey, here's areas where we have direct labor that goes to direct efforts. But I think what Tom's saying is it is pretty labor intensive to do that at a, at a highly detailed way. We'd be happy to come back to you with some like categories that we think make sense in a way to look at these programs. But the ROI itself of each individual program, we look at really closely and we don't engage in efforts. And in fact, you know, prior to my term um, with One Care of the past 14 months, have stopped doing many things over time and started doing other things. But you know, there are programs like CPR that have been very well received and you've gotten numerous amounts of feedback saying they're good programs. It may be hard for us to sort of parse out and say, here's how much it would cost to operate CPR as a standalone entity. Because I think that's what Dr. Merman was referring to. Like if, if one cared to stop doing that program and you wanted to keep doing it, how much would it cost to run that? We can tell you, here are the things that you need to do in order to run that program, but it might be hard for us to say, this is exactly how much it costs us to run it. So maybe there's a balance somewhere in the middle of, we can tell you, here are the things that we think go into each one of these programs. 
And here are some of the fixed things that the ACO has that we think you have to have to do a risk arrangement and to offer services like this. But getting down to the granularity of it, it's, it's you know, 11% of our budget to run this program and 3% of our budget to run that one. That's, that's, that's where we're a little bit more concerned of assigning direct costs. Um, typically, when this, you know, rage happened in healthcare, people would do time studies to do time-driven activity-based costing on very granular, small things. So, for example, we're going to look at one area of lab and one particular test and see how much that costs. But to do it broadly became overwhelming. So they decided, you know what, we'll only look at discrete processes and try to assign costs that way. Um, all that is a lot of words to say, we want to work with you to get where you want to go. It's just we're trying to be honest about how much effort that will take away from other stuff that we want to do because we have a finite amount of labor and time to do it. And you know, I think, Chair Foster, you sort of brought up the six-minute increments. I used to build in 15-minute increments when I was in public accounting, so I totally understand that. Um, but that was largely a function of how I got paid. Like, the firm got paid based on my time. That's not really how the ACO currently receives revenue. So it's not really a requirement to do to get paid necessarily. It's it's really to meet this obligation. So I'm trying to find a way that's lower um, administrative burden to do that and to give you the information you want. So anyway, that, this is my two cents on it. Thank you. Yeah, and we also, I mean, use that kind of time to track what kind of resources we're putting on different matters, not just to get paid, but how are we allocating to different matters? So, I mean, may, I'm not an accountant, but that's how we do it. Um, why don't we, Keep going. I see Tom Walsh, but this is helpful, and we're trying to be collaborative to make this work in a way that is responsive to your realities, but also our needs of protecting the spend on, on things to make sure that it's being productive. So we appreciate your feedback and trying to find a path that can make this work for the board's regulatory needs, and, and thank you for doing that. So I'll go to Tom Walsh, and then we'll move on because people have some hard stops. You, are you okay, Tom? Yeah, <clears throat> it's fine to move on. Um, you get on what I was going to say. Great. OK, we'll turn to thank you for the feedback and we'll go to Michelle Sawyer. Great, thank you. So um, a somewhat related topic is the FY25 budget guidance for OneCare. Um, we're here to review some proposed changes um from the fy24 guidance and there is a potential vote noticed so we did have a, a public comment period open from may 15th through the 20th but we did not receive any public comment to date um here is the timeline for this process from basically now through the end of the year um, the aco budget guidance is released by july 1st of each year um, because of the timing of other board processes, we were able to move up the consideration and poten potentially the issuance of the FY25 budget guidance sooner. Um, the certification materials and the Medicare only ACO guidance will likely be issued closer to July 1st. The budget submission is still due October 1st, so that has not changed. And the board, uh, as every year is the case, must vote on all ACO budgets by December 31st. So I wanted to walk everyone through the staff process for the development of this guidance. Following the FY24 budget vote, the staff held meetings in January to gather board feedback regarding the FY24 guidance and the budget process while it was still fresh on everyone's mind. Um, there was a general consensus that many questions could be removed from the narrative as they either resulted in duplicative or less helpful information, um, or some others could be removed as they were better addressed during a hearing that would be allow for better dialogue between parties. Second, we cross-referenced um, the guidance with Rule 5.403 and 18 BSA 9382 to ensure that we weren't removing any required questions or appendices mistakenly. Uh, we went through and cited every remaining question within the guidance narrative to the applicable section in the rule and statute. Third, we uh, asked both the Office of the Healthcare Advocate and OneCare to review the drafted budget guidance materials and provide feedback. So here are the goals overall for 2025 guidance. Um, first, we're really looking for the right information in the right format. And that looks like 
paring down information that's really closely linked to what is in statute. Um, we also recreated tables that OneCare had provided to us previously in, uh, in their narrative um, and put those into the workbook instead so there could just be an easier analysis. Um, we eliminated appendices that were not tightly tied to requirements um, of the budget consideration. Um, and then second, we eliminated questions that the board had agreed um, resulted in less helpful answered or were better uh, suited for a hearing or a discussion um, and in an effort to reduce the administrative burden. I know that is something that is on all of our minds uh, right now. And then lastly, and, and perhaps most importantly, um, or notably at the very least, we really focused this guidance on the future. So we phrased a lot of questions to elicit answers that are forward looking to what is next for the ACO and what's next for the you know, Vermont and healthcare reform. We did um, retain a lot of questions focused around lessons learned from past and current programs so that these lessons can be applied to the future. I wanted to share this one paragraph from the introduction section of the guidance as I felt that it really summarizes what the board is looking for within the ACO's FY25 budget submission. So recognizing the business year 2025 is the final year of this ACO payment model, the GMCB is focusing the budget guidance on ensuring appropriate final year ACO costs that reflect the value to Vermonters of the ACO ensuring sufficient oversight of the ACO and reporting data and information that will assist in future efforts while reducing reporting that will no longer be useful. As such, the approach to the guidance is to suggest the ACO minimize costs to support only programs shown to yield positive financial returns for Vermonters and to finish out this model while freeing up resources to be deployed for future purposes. All right, so part one of the guidance um, is around budget targets. As laid out in rule, the board has the authority to set benchmarks, or as we call them here, targets, to signal to the ACO what the board would like to see in their budget submission. Targets are not binding. The ACO may not meet a target, but must explain and justify that choice to the board. If the ACO does meet a target, they can expect less scrutiny in that particular area of their submission. So let's walk through what has changed between last year's budget targets and this year's. So the first is that the commercial benchmark trend rates must be consistent with the ACO attributed population and the GMCB approved rate filings. We are keeping that target unchanged for this year. There had been a target around FPP goals um, and because the movement in um, the achievement of fixed perspective payment in the commercial payer arena has really been stagnant for some number of years. We did remove that goal and we really didn't feel like it was tightly tied to statute or rule. Um, the next is that last year we had a target around the ACO holding Medicare advanced shared savings dollars as risk. Um, and I do have an asterisk just noting that um, while they didn't do that in their budget submission or submission, we the board chose to slightly modify that in the budget order, having them hold that uh, hold those dollars at risk, as well as um, an increased dollar amount that we'll talk about next. So what we decided for 2025 is that the ACO should have discretion to hold or disperse risk uh, to their network as they see fit. The logic here is that, um, you know, it looks like global budgets are a very real possibility for the future and that hospitals, um, if that comes to be, will be um, holding a large amount of risk and that um, to shield them from that at this point doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In uh, 2024, there was a budget target uh, encouraging the ACO to increase all of their risk corridors. Um, this was not met in their budget submission, but the board ordered one care to increase the risk corridor in the Medicare payer program by 1% and to hold that increased that 1% at the um, entity level. The change for FY25 is that one care may drop that extra 1%, um, but they have to maintain at least the FY23 corridors um, for FY25 among their public payers. Um, 
in the next iteration of the all payer model extension, there is an option for an asymmetric risk corridor and the budget target allows for the ACO to choose that path uh, as well, sh should they so choose. Next one is the ratio of operating expenses to PHM payments should be less than or equal to the five-year average. We just simplified it a little bit. The ratio should be less than or equal to the FY24 amount. Next, there were placeholders for two targets regarding executive compensation that didn't end up coming to be, um, so we did remove those. The next is the ratio of operating expenses to attributed lives uh, should be at the prior year minimum, and we did carry that forward for 2025. Um, and the performance improvement plan for three metrics based on performance in the Medicare ACO performance benchmarking report. So one care was to choose three metrics um, that there was room for improvement on and really focus on that. Um, and we have not changed that for 2025 guidance, and we are encouraging them to keep the same three areas of focus because we understand it takes more than one program year to really um, make a, a large impact on these things. There are a handful of new proposed budget targets for 2025. First being the ACO's administrative budget should not include expenses associated with programs not demonstrated to yield positive financial results for Vermonters. It should only include programs necessary and resources necessary for it to satisfy the all payer model requirements. Next, should the ACO choose to participate as a Medicare shared savings program ACO in FY25 and leave Vermont's all payer accountable care organization model agreement, one care must submit a new budget that reflects uh, the fact that its value to the state is more limited and must provide any and all additional information as requested by the board. And lastly, whether uh, under the APM or MSSP, the ACO must account for its administ uh, administrative budget by providing a breakout of the budget by function. All right, that wraps up the targets. So part two of the guidance um, has several sections and we'll just walk through. I'll try to be um, as brief as I can, but these slides do get rather wordy. So the executive summary, we're really focusing on network and programmatic changes from FY24 um, and lessons for the future. So previously, you know, we asked kind of summarize your budget, summarize your programs, much like an executive summary might be, um, to reduce the amount um, of writing and, and explanation needed, we really just want to hear about changes. Um, you know, we have several years under our belt working with OneCare, and we have a pretty solid idea of a lot of their, you know, how they budget, how their programs work. Just tell us what's changed. And then that last bullet focuses on uh, a description of any lessons that they've learned through programmatic evaluation and how they will influence the ACO's programs in the budget year and beyond the budget year. Uh, section two is provider contracts. We are continuing to collect data um, regarding the ACO network participation. It's largely unchanged, um, the rationale being that having an accurate count and a picture state of um, statewide engagement uh, with the ACO through the last year of the all-payer model is useful for any uh, future analyses. Section three is payer contracts. Again, we're trying to pare things down, really focusing on new payer contracts and any changes to current contracts. So scale and program uh, alignment forms are previously required every year for each payer program and now are only required for any new payer programs. However, we will collect a copy of all contracts just to have, you know, if we need to check anything, have that reference. Um, we have asked for a, just a narrative description of any new contracts, changes made to continuing contracts and explanations for terminated contracts. There were several questions removed in this section as we found that they didn't really tie tightly to requirements in statute and rule, and we felt in our efforts to pare things down, these ones could just be let go. So we removed questions around fixed perspective payment targets, work with Medicare Advantage plans, work on risk-bearing commercial plans, and the global payment pilot with DEBA. And I'll just note that, you know, it, after we get uh, the budget submission, we can always ask follow-up questions um, if we didn't get the information that we needed. Section four, uh, total cost of care. 
we are continuing to collect this type of data through the workbook, but with less narrative. So Appendix 4.1 is unchanged, um, and Appendix 4.2 is also unchanged, but we did shorten up the, the narrative that goes along with that appendix. Um, and we removed narrative questions around drivers and assumptions for total cost of care and descriptions of adjustment factors for settlements. Section five, programs and risk. Um, we are looking for less, less granular risk data, but slightly more granular network settlement data in a way. Um, we tied descriptions of programs, so we asked for descriptions of their programs, but we really, we used more um, direct language pulled from the rule to just make sure that that's what we're focusing on. Um, the Appendix 5.1 um, ACO risk by payer was previously collected both at the payer level and then at the HSA, so we had risk by payer at, for the hospital, for non-hospital primary care and hospital primary care for every HSA. Um, and we just felt like that level was no longer necessary. So this a particular appendix will collect um, ACO risk by payer held by one care and by their network. And we don't get any more uh, into the weeds than that. There is a new appendix 5.2. This um, particular appendix was a follow-up question that we had sent to OneCare uh, last year after they submitted their budget, so we felt it prudent to just include it up front this time. Um, it is a projected 2024 um, settlement. Um, what do they anticipate going back or coming from the accountability pool, which is really the primary care risk um, mechanism versus um, settlement for the hospitals. And we removed narrative descriptions of provider payment strategies and methodologies, risk model and stratification methodology, um, and we did remove uh, the old Appendix 5.2 because when we removed the um, HSA level data, we found that what was left was duplicative of other, appendi uh, other appendices that we already collected. Section six is the financial budget section. There are new appendices per the budget order, but there is less narrative overall. Um, we added Appendix 6.9, which collects uh, a history of OneCare's net assets year over year. Um, this ties back to a budget order condition in their FY24 budget order. We added Appendix 6.10, a budget by function and program. There has been some modification um, to this since the since what we sent um, to OneCare as part of their revised budget. Um, we did receive from OneCare what they recommended for categories, um, and we, we are definitely very open to finding uh, some middle ground here and something that works for all of us, serves the needs of uh, the board, and reduces administrative burden. Um, so there may need to be some more work on this, um, and, and I'm happy to share uh, at the end if board members have questions about its current status, maybe we can look at it. Um, we did remove narrative descriptions of adaptive and workbook submissions, um, and we reserved just descriptions of what changed between 24 and 25. Um, and a note on adaptive, we're no longer requiring OneCare to submit their financial statements in adaptive. They requested that they, they um, just submit it using Excel, and we have no problem with that. Um, we removed narrative questions around executive compensation benchmarking methods. We have that information now, um, but we will continue to collect uh, that data in an appendix. Um, one note about that is that we did um, remove director level positions from that appendix. So it's, you know, uh, C-suite and vice president, um, but we will collect salary data, the benchmark, the applicable benchmarks, and uh, the variable pay. And then we moved the request for the Form 990 to the reporting manual as we felt as though the timing of the budget submission really just didn't make uh, the most sense to include that as part of the guidance. Okay, and then um, section seven was the quality population health and uh, model of care section. So we're, again, we're really focusing on changes. 
um, between the program years and lessons learned for the future. So the model of care, um, we're reframing to focus on changes, lessons learned for the future. Um, we combine the questions um, around clinical focus areas with uh, the quality improvement questions. And we're focusing on KPI performance. Before we had asked a lot about how they're performing on their PHM measures, but we find you know, we can get that information through their board of managers meetings and we don't need them to provide that information if we are able to access it ourselves. Um, and we removed some questions and appendices around care coordination, integration of social services, primary care incentive funds, and the public health emergency, again, because we felt as though in our efforts to streamline things, they weren't tightly tied to statute or rule, and we could simply do without. Section eight is performance benchmarking, um, continued focus here on ACO improvement activities. We trimmed down questions to focus on network surveys the ACO is conducting in 2024 and what they're planning for 2025 and how they're improving those survey practices um, and how they are um, improving their evaluation of their population health management programs. Um, any note of the ROI is moved to the reporting manual and regarding the Medicare ACO benchmarking report, um, we have a, the same question as last year. How is the ACO working to improve performance on those three metrics um, of focus as we uh, saw in their budget submission for FY24? And the last section is uh, around the all-payer model. We eliminated Appendix 9.1 um, as the staff had not found this information to be directly informative of the board's decision-making process. Um, however, there is a single question that remains to keep a pulse on One Care's efforts to align its priorities with the all-payer model extension. Part three is just a little blurb, and it's one page, less than one page, and it just describes the revised budget process. It's not a required part of the guidance. Um, so I wanted to invite the board to consider doing something different with this in the budget guidance this year. Um, and so these are kind of three proposals that I have. We could certainly just keep it the same. We could do our best to come up with a description or even keep the description that we have of the revised budget in there as it has um, appeared for the last several years. It's basically... Um, a copy of what has appeared in budget order conditions relating to the revised budget year over year. Um, so we could keep it the same. We could consider modifying it. Um, some ideas given, you know, the process that we all just went through a couple of weeks ago, we could look at saying the revised budget isn't necessary unless there's a certain, you know, a certain threshold is met with a change in attribution. Um, we could delegate the determination of the usefulness of a revised budget process to GMCB staff. Um, we could create language that allows the ACO to specifically request waiver or a modification of these requirements. Um, and I'm sure there are other ideas for modifying it as well. And um, the other thing you could consider today is eliminating this particular really just paragraph from the guidance, and we could just address it through the budget order in December when um, we've gotten their initial budget submission. Um, and, you know, this this revised budget language is not binding. And so if we want a budget order condition um, outlining the revised budget process, we can just put it in the budget order later this year. So summary of the work done. Um, we've worked to really balance administrative burden as much as we can with statutory requirements and interests of the board. Um, we updated the timeline for the budget guidance issuance. Um, we were looking at the right questions in the right format, calling of all the questions that were duplicative, um, and then changes in future focus. What's changed since 2024 and what, what have we learned for the future? Um, and I do have, you know, proposed motion language should the board decide to vote today, but at this point, I will hand it back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you very much, 
That's really helpful. And you did a great job with the guidance and balancing all of the needs and context that we're in this year. Um, so thank you very much for you and, and Angela. Um, I'll turn it over to the board for any questions or comments. I have a couple, um, but I don't need to go first if somebody else would like to jump in. <clears throat> go first, you're up. All right. Um, on the new budget condition related to the admin budget, um, I'm so it the way the language in the slides reads is um, admin budget should not include expenses associated with programs. Not yes, thank you. <laughs> Much better than me reading it out loud. Um, demonstrated to yield positive financial results for Ver, for Vermonters. Um, I. I'm wondering if folks would be open to broadening it beyond financial. So, for example, if there's a quality improvement, um, that would be something that I would be interested in supporting, not just total cost of care. And then the other question I had um, is how we're going to kind of evaluate this, because, for example, I don't think I would say today that something that I think is a really good program and should continue like CPR has demonstrated positive financial results for Vermonters. I would say it's demonstrated positive financial results for primary care providers, which is something I wanna support, but I don't feel like you can necessarily track that directly back to, to Vermonters. So, um, and I don't think the intent, you know, I know everyone is quite supportive of CPR. So for ex using that just as the example, I'm, I'm just concerned that it might be a little too narrow to include things that the, there may be a majority of the board that still wants to support it with administrative support. So um, that was a suggestion I was gonna make is, could we look at broadening that language a little bit? Um, and, the other, so that's one comment. The second comment is I like the idea of doing something different with the revised budget process. I um, would be fine, you know, coming up with a threshold or delegating that to staff to like make a recommendation or eliminating it and dealing it with it later. So I, I liked those ideas. Um, I don't feel like, wedded to any particular version. Um, and then my third comment was just given the discussion and the input we're expecting on the admin by budget, if we do vote today, which I'm happy to do if others are ready, um, it would be for me with the understanding that, that the tab with the categories would need to be reflect our future decision around the 24 budget order. So I'm not exactly, you know, we'll have to kind of work on the motion language to reflect that. So those are my three thoughts. I can pop in. Um, it, interesting. I had the exact same two slides, uh, Robin, as, as you, if Ari's interested in, I, the, I think on my first pass through the positive, the term financial didn't grab me when I read them, but definitely today I, I, I agree. I think we, there are, I think we need to think about the language on that a little bit more. I think the financial results for Vermonters, I think the CPR program is an example of that. I do think also, Oh, case management services for um, uh, for people in Vermont. Uh, it, it just gets it, these things can get really super hard to quantify financially. Um, so I guess um, I, I, I guess I'm gonna stop there. I just think I need to would think need to think a little bit about how to nuance that so that that we. Can can define maybe the positive results, even if they aren't financial in some in some meaningful way. Um, but 
but let me think more about that. Uh, regarding slide 20, um, with the revised budget, can we pull that back up again real quick? I, I, um, I think Michelle, I like the idea of, uh, I don't really feel confident in defining a percentage between now and when we vote on this guidance. So either delegating it for determination of usefulness or when we uh, do the budget order in December, defining that a little bit more clearly. Um, I think that there, I think that there's known avenues for the HPO to request waivers or modifications. So I don't know if we need to call that out specifically here. Um, th that was just my one, my, my comments on this. So I, I guess I would sort of go th through either delegate or just sort of write this into the under, I think we may have a lot more understanding of the relevance of this in December than we do now, especially given sort of where everything is in flux. Uh, so, so, so I, I'd be comfortable with putting that later on. That's it. I think you're going to hear a theme here, but I, I, I would agree with the language change around financial benefit. I think we have to think through what that means. I'm even just thinking about data and analytics. How do you quantify the value of that? And and we know it's valuable. So um, I think we just need to change that language. Um, I also, I would punt, I think, on the revised budget language in here. I like the idea of delegating to staff. Um, the ACO has uh, quarterly reporting. Um, and so, you know, has reporting, maybe even more frequently than that, I have to remember. But the staff can always look for material changes and bring them to the attention of the board if we need to, um, you know, look for adjustments to the budget or ask some questions. And I also think we have another pass at this, as others have said, in the hospital budget process. I mean, sorry, in the in the budget approval process in December. So I think I would just my gut would be to remove it from this guidance and think through um, that either that delegation or the we might look at it again in December. But I just actually wanted to say more broadly, I really appreciate the effort here to streamline um, this guidance and to uh, align it better with our statute. And I do think these are the right questions. So I really appreciate the staff's work here. I'd like to um, follow up with that um, and thank you, Michelle, and the rest of the staff for um, you know, looking at our own work critically and seeing how we can improve. Um, and I'll join the chorus. I think the language about financial impact for Vermonters is something that we need to think um, more about. Um, and I think um, that language may change over the life of an ACO, right? Because dollar is meant for transformation efforts in the first years of an organization may not lead to financial benefit or financial dollars spent on something like data analytics or transformation um, may not seem that that benefit may not show up for some time. But eight years in to a model, we ought to be seeing some trends toward the transformation actually occurring and outcomes that matter to Vermonters actually improving. If we're seven, eight, nine, ten years into a model and we're not seeing that, then we need to, we as regulators, um, need to question whether that money is actually being well spent. So understanding that um, there can be a period of investment where the return doesn't show up quite so soon. Um, secondly, I am in favor of delegating to staff, keeping an eye on things and bringing it to our attention. Um, but I don't see the delegation or a review uh, later in the year as either or. I think it would be both, right? The delegation is flag it for us to review sooner. But yes, we are going to uh, review it later.
I am in accord with the other board members comments on the opportunities to improve some of the language. So thank you. We can get some feedback um, on that and see if we can work on it. Um, any public comment? Mr. Boris. Hello again. Uh, the first and probably most important sentiment I'd like to express is gratitude. Thank you to the staff. Um, for just hearing us a little bit about uh, you know the challenges that we've had with the budget and really trying to evolve to look towards the future. Very much appreciated. Thank you also specifically for allowing us to submit our budget in Excel rather than adaptive. I think that'll create efficiencies for, for everybody. So um, just want to express my thanks uh, to the staff for, for that. Uh, a couple technical ones on slide eight, I think it was around the risk corridors. I recommend the language is amended to reference the public payer programs uh, and because commercials are negotiated, having a specific target in there, you know, may not be agreeable to the counterparty. And in fact, in 2023, we had a fairly different risk arrangement with some of our commercials. So I, I think making that specific to public payers um, would increase the likelihood that we can satisfy the order and keep our commercial programs up and running. So first comment. Um, see, next, I'll just echo many of the sentiments expressed by board members around slide 10 and the, the language around the administrative budget, not including expenses, not demonstrated to yield positive results for Vermonters. I appreciate the spirit of this. What I ask for or hope that we can find is some sort of a, a clearer standard of measuring this so it's more objective. Either we fulfilled the obligation or we didn't. And I think um, based on all the comments made thus far, um, It'll be unclear in our budget process whether or not we've satisfied this. We, we would certainly be there saying we believe all, everything that we do is in spirit of improving uh, you know, results, whether financial or otherwise, for Vermonters. But it's it's difficult if it's not clear how that will be measured. And then um, last one on the revised budget. I'll put some thought into this too, and uh, perhaps in our written comment uh, back, we can, uh, depending on if a vote happens today, we can think about. Um, how to make that work efficiently for everybody. And you know, there's an interesting history around the revised budget that members Holmes and Lange might remember that early on when we were first kind of endeavoring in this regulatory space, it was challenging because our budget was built largely on estimates, still is uh, to a large degree. Um, so we really offered to come back in the spring and say, how about we come and show you how things varied or changed and they've got coined a revised budget. I think there's value in doing that for transparency and helping you as a regulator understand, here's what we estimated would happen. And then here's the result of negotiations and attribution and total cost of care processes, et cetera. So just thought that historical context might be useful because I, I do think there's some value here, but um, if we can figure out how to make it work efficiently and effectively for everybody, I think it will serve us all well. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I did, I've got a comments that go about three minutes. I've got a stopwatch, I'll cut myself off. I wanna look at just the, what I think we've completely lost sight here of the basic history of what's going on here. One Care Vermont is an ACO that when the ACO was authorized in the 2010 uh, Obamacare legislation that passed in the federal government. The basic purpose of that legislation is to move from fee-for-service uh, reimbursement to capitated, capitated reimbursement, and that is going to, which is, is going to would save about a third of the total cost. Uh, that happened in that happened that happened. It was passed in 2010. We started moving on it in about 20. 13, 20, 14, okay? And we went, we had, we, we called it the all payer waiver, the all one care, whatever, or the uh, all payer model, um, which wasn't really one, one payer, but it was close. Um, the, the, uh, uh, and so what actually happened over a 10 year period was actually nothing. The reason was that while that neither Blue Cross or no other insurance companies, nor the federal government would allow uh, a, a, any system, okay, to use to use to uh, apply capitation to uh, to uh, Medicare. They just they just wouldn't do it. They would have uh, prospective reimbursement, but they would not 
they would not allow they would not allow you to stick with it. You had it was a shadow a shadow calculation, and you had to uh, change it back to FIFA service later in the year. Uh, and so it, so what what happened is that uh, the there was no question about the purpose. The federal government in the mid teens. Uh, set up a system that said there were the, that the that any system in, in any state in the United States could uh, move um, to where they wanted them to be in four steps. The fourth step was full capitation. Step one was full fee for service. Vermont, what the what One Care Vermont has has done, okay, is set up machinery that permits capitation, but nobody nobody is going to use it. Uh, what, the second thing I want to point out is, why is that? Why do you suppose nobody would? And why do you suppose nobody in this whole system in Vermont wants to even talk about the whole problem of what's going on in the system beyond UVMMC? The reality is that neither you folks nor the feds have any stomach at all but dealing with the political blowback that will come from rationalizing a system that has 14 full service hospitals. The, the data shows that the, that the um, average daily census in one of those is one. And, that, and, the, and the idea of doing, uh, uh, doing complicated stuff, heavy surgeries, including not just joint replacement, but stuff like uh, back back uh, spinal uh, surgeries sp including uh, uh, different uh, uh, really complicated kinds of, of su stuff like that the, the 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 reason that is happening is because the small hospitals the the non academic medical centers the non dharma hitchcocks and the non uvms and the non and, and and the normal big players they can they the only, the reason they're doing that stuff which they shouldn't do okay is because they can't keep the doors open any other way they think they have to have the money for that okay because they just can't they just can't survive without it okay so finally this is the last. If you're not gonna, um, if, if you're not gonna use it for, um, if you if you're not gonna use this system, if you're not gonna use one care for the system for which it was devised, okay, then what it, you've got is you've, you this a wild, huge, bureaucratic, crazy system. This all this stuff and includes this one care the not one care. This includes the ahead system. Okay, is having failed in ten years to put to put to ever you even use the the all payer model. Then that well, now we're going to go into another ten year program that is also going to just run into this problem that nobody is nobody is willing nobody is willing to get their hands around what's really gone in the going on in the delivery system on the ground. What we could save by really by shifting reimbursement is a full third, 4.3 trillion in the United States. You just take a third of that and you could cut it off. It would take four or five years, but it would be a lot of money. And in Vermont, you could cut 300 to 500 million dollars a year out of your system if you had any any uh, stomach. OK, but at dealing with what the real problems are anyway. Thank you. Um, I went over 45 seconds. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I got you two minutes over, Mr. Davis. I had you go into 1122. I got you at 1125. <laughs> uh, that, that, I apologize for that, sir. Uh, that actually, the reason oh. is I really didn't do that deliberately. I just forgot to stop the damn the, the, the uh, watch. No, no, that's you, okay. You, I, you are right about that. I appreciate the comments, and I thought they were really helpful. So thank you for thank you for taking taking the time because it's valuable. Um, a lot of really good points there. One I did want to point out and respond to because I think you've mentioned it a couple times. Um. I don't know exactly the phrase, but the political blowback on the 14 hospitals and the the footprint of our hospital system is something that you've raised a couple times. And, and I did just want to flag the the work that Oliver Wyman is doing and the set of recommendations on transformation that will be coming out and a, a, a long series of meetings with communities on this exact topic. Um, those recommendations are going to be 
shared with hospitals, I think the week of June 10th ish, and then in health service areas around July, a couple of weeks after that. And then in terms of like, like the political blowback and all that, the, the transformation work that's coming out of that is being laid by, led by the Agency of Human Services. So they, not the care board, are really um, the, the folks, if you have feedback you want to provide on this issue, um, they're going to be leading the transformation work that comes out of that Oliver Wyman report and, and, and effort. Um, it would be great. I would love for you to attend, if you're able, some of the health service area um, meetings and get some of your feedback on this topic. So, so thanks for raising that. I just wanted to kind of give you some dates and background, and our staff can send you uh, specific dates and information if it's helpful. Um, Mr. Pice from the Healthcare Advocate. Good morning. Um, just wanted to thank Michelle, the board, and OneCare for the conversation today. Um, just briefly on the guidance, um, we support the guidance. I think it's a thoughtful, reasonable recalibration is really the word that comes to mind for me. Um, I also agree with, the, I think, the intent of the conversation around broadening the language that was discussed, the introductory language to the guidance. I, I would suggest that maybe revising or consider revising something to say the, you know, ask one care to demonstrate that it's minimized costs so that, and then provide the burden on the regulated entity as, as I think is always um, a part of the board rules um, and require one care to demonstrate evidence that the programs are of benefit to Vermonters. And I, I agree, I think that can be financial. I also think to remember Lunge's point, that can include quality. Um, and I think if I can go back briefly on the amendment conversation, I just had a question and a comment. Um, and I, we don't have to pull up the motion language, but I just want to leave the board with, with a couple thoughts from our office on that. Are the, I wonder if the motions that are being comp contemplated, the two motions, are they, if they're mutually exclusive, um, meaning could both of them happen at the same time if the board believes that both could be required to you know, obligate one care to perform what the board intends. Um, and I think on the primary care language discussion, I, I think for us, it's most important that the language is clear and explicit. I think something around saying directly support primary care providers would be more warranted because I just would worry about language being squishy. Um, so just a couple thoughts there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that's all we have on the agenda today. And thank you everyone for attending and for the conversation. Um, is there any older new business for the board? Okay, and I will move that we adjourn and we take up these potential motions on the uh, ACO work, uh, hopefully next week. Is there a second to adjourn? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, everyone, and we'll see others at one o'clock and have a nice lunch. Adjourned. Great. Okay. I'll call to order our afternoon meeting of May 22nd, 2024. Um, we have a distinguished group of national healthcare policy experts to provide us information on value-based care and the head model. Um, and I'll turn it to Director Barraby to introduce the panelists and to lead the discussion. Thank you all for being here very, very much. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll be brief because I, I want to spend most of the time allowing our panelists to um, impart their wisdom and, and leave time for questions. Um, but I did want to set the stage briefly. Um, so as you know, Vermont, like many states, continues to struggle to provide high quality, accessible and affordable care to its entire population. Um, and while there are no doubt been significant investments in healthcare and great efforts by many to advance healthcare reform, there's still much work to be done. Vermont has been long at the forefront and has been looked to as a leader in healthcare reform. However, at the same time, we continue to be among the most expensive states um, for healthcare, and in many parts of our state, struggle with access to essential services, especially in some of our most rural communities. Um, so as you know, we're currently discussing with our partners at the Agency of Human Services, um, as well as providers across the continuum of care and many other stakeholders, including the public, um, where and how Vermont will move forward in its payment and delivery system reform efforts, and that work is still taking shape. 
Um, so we've invited this panel of esteemed experts to share their lessons learned, um, either from their direct experience advancing payment and delivery system reform in other states, or working within a delivery system, or from their academic research. Um, so it's imperative that we hear from many voices um, as we continue to evaluate options available to Vermont in its next chapter to improve health and affordability of health care for Vermonters. Um, so I want you know to I'll turn it over to each of the panelists to introduce themselves and provide a short bio. Um, but I wanted to welcome Carrie Kala, um, a professor from the Dartmouth Institute, Bruce Hamery of Oliver Wyman, uh, William Henderson, um, our principal deputy director from Maryland's Healthcare Cost Review Commission, overseeing medical economics and data analysis. Janice Walters, um, Executive Director from Rural Health Redesign Center, who also um, led the implementation of the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model, um, as well as Robert Murray, President of Global Health Payment, who previously was the Executive Director um, at Maryland's Health Services Cost Review Commission. Um, so a lot of folks with a lot of ex expertise and we're excited. So um, I will pass the baton first to Carrie and we'll kind of go in order. Thank you. Sure. I get the prerogative of having the um, first last name in the alphabet potentially. Um, so hello, thanks so much for having me. Um, as Lena mentioned, I'm an economist and a professor at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice at Dartmouth College. Um, I've recently returned to Dartmouth after working at the Congressional Budget Office for the past few years in Washington. And so I had some catching up to do um, on the current state of Vermont's planning. But I first wanted to say how impressed I've been by the, the thought, the care, the analytics and the approach that you've all taken, the Agency of Human Services and the Green Mountain Care Board toward approaching this uh, problem. As a researcher in payment and delivery system reform and, and rural health care, and a former advisor to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, it's amazing to me to see how you, much you've accomplished in terms of analysis and planning and what you're considering now. So my understanding of kind of our role here today is that you're gathering as much information as possible now to be able to make a well-informed decision once you have the results and the additional parameters uh, from CMS. Does that sound right? Okay, I just wanted to get you all to interact a little bit, thanks. Um, so I'll start by saying that it's my belief that payment reform is a necessary but not sufficient condition to achieve the healthcare system transformation you're striving for. Um, so, so what do I mean by this? Uh, if you were to start from scratch and design a new payment system today, you wouldn't magically have system transformation in the short run, obviously. So that is to say, other factors are also necessary catalysts to achieve your desired outcome. But without changing the way we pay for healthcare today, I don't believe we can achieve the transformation and financial stability Vermonters and our providers are looking for. So key things are definitely going right for Vermonters in the health space. Yet, as you're aware, the status quo has myriad challenges that must be addressed. Some of the problems I'm aware of include inadequate workforce and staffing, transportation infrastructure, delivery system financial instability, affordability for patients, access to essential services, among others. Um, it's clear to me that the AHEAD program on its own will not solve all of these problems. Additional leadership will be needed to make the services needed align with patient demand in these areas. So, because I'm kind of a payment incentive nerd, I thought, I thought I'd start with how do we get to where we are today? And many of you know this, but Medicare's payment design to support rural healthcare has in part shaped the landscape of services and the financial situation facing us today. We have a poor distribution of essential services, which I think of as like primary care, behavioral health, maternity care, and in emergency and long-term care services. The federal government historically supported rural health through a patchwork of payment mechanisms, but most of that money flowed through these add-on payments for critical access hospitals, Medicare dependent hospitals, low volume adjustments, sole community hospital, like all these different designations made up a patchwork of ways we, we added on rural payments. But all of these rely on inpatient care for the most part, critical access is a little bit of an exception, but and in particular fee-for-service Medicare beneficiary stays. Yet the payment world has changed, the healthcare world has changed since these policies were enacted. And these financing mechanisms are no longer either optimal or sustainable way to support rural re residents and maintain essential health services for them. 
Rural hospitals are financially vulnerable today due to reductions in inpatient stays and increases in Medicare Advantage, which is my understanding Medicare Advantage makes up about 40% of the Medicare market share in Vermont, but because of the patients who are selecting into the Medicare Advantage programs and those payment mechanisms I mentioned, it's a much smaller share of the spending, about a quarter of the share of fee-for-service Medicare spending. Um, I also believe that about nine out of your 14 hospitals are operating in the red and that Vermont now has the fourth highest percentage of rural hosp hospitals operating in a loss in the country, like the fourth highest state. So changes in information technology, clinical technology, cybersecurity, reporting and analytics have changed the landscape for independent hospitals and make it difficult or impossible now for small hospitals to survive. So we need to change the payment environment in order to address the needs of our providers and patients today. Modern care teams include community health workers, patient navigators, and behavioral health specialists. And fee-for-service has, fee has proven inadequate to support this needed team-based care. Many in, in our US Congress and in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services recognize the status quo is not optimal or sustainable in terms of supporting rural health care and some changes have, have begun. The recent addition of the rural emergency hospital designation and recent increases in payment for rural health clinics are, are to name a few. But further financing changes are likely to take a couple more years, at least. Uh, One Care has set Vermont on a path to payment reform through its focus on total cost of care. The AHEAD model's objectives are well aligned with the blueprint and Vermont's needs now including a long-term commitment to predictable prospective financial flows through global budgets that account for social and medical risks of Vermonters, money for infrastructure, the continuation of waivers, continued investments in primary care, and support for connections to community resources, which I know are important. Um, I teach classes on payment incentive and incentive design, and um, you, you and I all know that it's very difficult to get them right. Um, last week at the provider meeting, there were many comments referring to the complexity of the AHEAD model. And so I, I just felt the need to remind everyone of the complexity of the current status quo. Fee-for-service is incredibly complex. I, I suppose it's the devil you know versus the devil you don't. But the place we are in today is one of these incremental changes resulting in a patchwork of payment programs. And it's a, a mess of misaligned incentives. I too am concerned with introducing further complexity, but I just wanna note that we're not moving forward from like a point of elegant simplicity today. Um, a couple of other things just to think about from a payment design perspective as you discuss how to proceed. Uh, what are the potential for unintended consequences? How will incentives created in the AHEAD program interact with other payment policies already in place? And particularly if not all payers or providers participate, and is there any possibility for strategic behavior under the new scheme? So changes in payment are inherently risky. Last week, the providers also mentioned that there's little room for error exists that exists in the upcoming design. But under the status quo, it will continue to be difficult for Vermont hospitals to get to a stable financial model while also balancing the need for affordability in the state. At the end of the last week, uh, last week's session, your chair asked whether transformation is possible without Medicare as a payment reform partner. I believe the answer is no. I believe the AHEAD program presents a much needed opportunity to change the way hospitals do business in Vermont. The counterfactual, what, what will happen without participation in the AHEAD program is difficult to predict right now. But um, he also mentioned the loss of waivers and additional payments supporting things like the blueprint, uh, primary care, the SASH program and other programs would be very difficult. Certainly the HEAD program is risky in itself, especially so if the commitment um, by, provi by providers and other payers does not come to fruition. Additional work and investment will continue to be needed on Vermont's healthcare workforce in particular, and on maintaining access to these essential services. But if creating a sustainable healthcare delivery system is a primary goal for Vermont, I see the AHEAD program as one way to partner with two of the largest payers, Medicare and Medicaid, to work on it. So thanks, I'll pass it to someone else and happy to answer questions. Great, and I, I think what we'll do is we'll have each of the panelists kind of go and then we can open it up for a broader discussion. So um, I'll pass it over to Dr. Bruce Hamery, if he, you're ready to go next. 
Well, good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Bruce Hamry. Uh, I trained as an adult infectious disease person many years ago. Uh, spent 22 years in academic medicine and uh, 17 uh, helping to run a large health system called Geisinger. Uh, and I uh, have been 10 years with Oliver Wyman as a partner and the uh, chief medical officer. Uh, I've had the opportunity and the pleasure to be engaged for the last uh, nine months in a program to assess and uh, make recommendations around improving um, all those things that were just mentioned, access, affordability, equity, um, financial stability uh, of hospitals, and look at the way um, care is delivered in the community uh, and what happens to people uh, before and after they are uh, either seen in the emergency room or in the hospital. Uh, certainly the data that uh, we have seen and gathered from hospitals um, supports the view that with the current trajectories of payment and expense, uh, there will be many hospitals uh, in serious financial trouble, uh, more serious financial trouble than they are now. Uh, the concern I have, and I'm going to try to share a screen. I have a couple of slides that, um, Oh dear here, where where are we? Um, I have a couple of slides that would, oh, wait a minute, wrong one. Um, uh, a couple of slides that would be helpful in doing this. One reflects the population trends. Uh, that we are um, experiencing in Vermont. And I think, as you know, uh, Vermont has the dubious privilege of being one of the oldest, if not with West Virginia, uh, having the uh, most rapidly aging population in the US. And that clearly has implications uh, for um, the direction of both federal payments but also a fairly dramatic decline in the population of young folk uh, who are going to have to pay for, uh, through commercial premiums, any differences between the, um, uh, the amounts paid by the, um, uh, the governmental payers. So that's that's one point. I agree with the comment. There is a serious shortage of health professional workforce across all levels. And that shortage will not be alleviated likely in the next 10 years. So it is something that has to be coped with uh, rather than um, uh, than work, you know, worked around, if you will. The, um, there we go. Can you see this screen? Okay. So this basically um, shows the uh, change in population. And this is by hospital service area. Service area is defined as uh, those zip codes where 51% of the residents seek care at a hospital. Uh, so it's not outpatient focused. The, um, and you see the dramatic de the decline in population everywhere except Burlington. Uh, the hospital, if you look at hospital um, coverage by virtue of a radius around the hospital rather than a specific service area, you note the overlap. And so one of the considerations about hospital sustainability and in fact, a delivery of outpatient services is whether some of that can be regionalized. And those analyses are going on now. I will um, 
just call to your attention uh, the fact as we think about clinical care and population health management that we have that classic 5% that accounts for the majority of healthcare expense. I would note that activities aimed at this high risk, the, um, the uh, aged, infirm, uh, with multiple clinic, uh, multiple medical conditions, as well as often uh, mental health issues, uh, and increasingly in many areas of the country, substance abuse disorder, um, that those efforts currently in the state are not well coordinated or targeted by anybody. There are specific programs aimed, for example, at substance use disorder uh, and uh, maternal child health where there are attempts to do this, uh, but in many instances not. Certainly, um, the data, as we'll talk in a minute, available, which would need to be used to um, predict and evaluate and identify, uh, is not commonly available. This is one way of looking at the hierarchy, if you will, uh, of healthcare needs. And most of it, as was said, should be able to be provided at a community and primary care level. Uh, following that would be a group who needs um, uh, help, whether it is uh, help with coping with behavioral or mental health, issues or infirmity and assisted living. Uh, home health can be part of that. Uh, next would be the institutional care. Uh, and then you really get to primary care. Uh, Urgy care, specialty care uh, are uh, more specialized. There is a problem in Vermont and has been with access to these services as well as to primary care. Um, and you see uh, down below the emergency room and at each of these levels, it's sort of a filter, right? The folks whose needs can't be met at that level fall down to the uh, wind up in the emergency room, which has the um, uh, issue of identifying uh, appropriate care, whether that's back to the community, and there are delays even in arranging for home health services, or it is to another institution, or it is to a hospital admission. And then, of course, the community hospital and the uh, referral hospital. Uh, when you constrain capacity, which is currently the case uh, in Vermont, you push that stuff down and it results in higher levels of emergency room views, use, which could be preventable, certainly in higher use in the uh, community care uh, hospitals and um, an increase in um, what, what are called in medicine borders, that is people who are on an inpatient ward in the hospital or on a stretcher in the emergency room for some period of time waiting for placement in a different appropriate level of care. And this also squeezes the, um, the financial uh, parameters, um, which are shown here. Uh, so this is data from the state healthcare budget um, from uh, one of the uh, state group, uh, state agencies, uh, and it basically shows the large proportion of care uh, done in hospitals, um, contrasted with the much smaller uh, rates of investment or pay for uh, the community prevention activities and primary care. Last, uh, I'll just mention, based on literature and a fair amount of um, experience, both in uh, my administrative roles and consulting roles at helping 
health systems and some other countries uh, redesign their healthcare programs. Um, the one of the essential features, as was mentioned, uh, is incentives that are necessary but not sufficient. And we'll talk about the the uh, other necessary components in a minute. But it's key that the financial incentives are aligned among all the participants. So for example, the primary care people need to be strongly incented to maintain access and to, where possible, prevent the progression of illness to the point where somebody needs to be seen in an emergency room or a hospital. And so very organized programs that rely mainly on people other than physicians to do this with protocols uh, and payments that are sufficient to get people's attention. So 1%, 5% is not enough. And this is one of those uh, things that I think will need careful consideration as the AHEAD model is uh, constructed. Second is that in order to take care of people, you have to know what they have, what's being done about it, and where they are. And that means timely clinical uh, information and then some periodic financial performance data so that people can correct their behavior in real time. Not a reconciliation six months after the end of a fiscal year, but real-time data that, uh, and actually real-time actionable information based on data. Adequate resources for uh, the community-based services need to be available. I know that this is a principal effort for the Blueprint on Health and a number of the state programs. Um, and to the degree possible, these need to be uh, facilitated and advanced. Uh, availability of referrals to specialists, again, major roadblock. Um, time periods of anywhere from three to 18 months to see a specialist about a, a, a problem. Now, I would note that a number of these problems are because the primary care folks don't handle uh, often uh, a headache. And when the specialist sees them and tries to refer them back, they may not have capacity uh, to take that patient back, which then uh, plugs up the specialty clinics. Uh, availability of appropriate levels of care other than inpatient beds, uh, mental health facilities um, are tight, being expanded. Uh, extended care facilities have closed because they can't afford to pay nurses. Uh, and then the ability of tertiary and other referral patients of uh, facilities to accept patient transfers. And clearly this is an issue as one thinks about rural emergency hospital designation because it affects not only the transfer protocols, the ability to have those contracts, but also um, the length of stay that the uh, rural emergency hospitals and uh, current uh, critical access hospitals are expected to meet. And then last and very important in Vermont and uh, a number of other places uh, is the availability of transportation to take a sick patient from an emergency room to a larger hospital that would have an appropriate level of care. Um, and this is, again, a large problem. Uh, it relates in part to the volunteer nature of the services and in large part to the decentralization of these activities. There are, if I remember correctly, 69 uh, separate EMS services with a varying ability to really transport people. Um, uh, so these would be the conditions, uh, in my view exper and experience, that are really needed to construct and have a successful population-based payment. 
And one of the concerns that I have without having had the uh, uh, more detail in the head model shared is whether hospital-based payments, when hospitals don't uh, control primary care networks, control ambulances, uh, and the ab ability of downstream, um, um, uh, the, the capacity of downstream facilities and other services to, to take care of the patients who don't need hospital or emergency room care, uh, when those things exist is uh, a question that I'm sure we'll be able to discuss. So uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, show some things and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I will turn it over to Janice Walters. Thank you. Uh, thank you. First, uh, thank you for allowing me to be part of this very important conversation. So uh, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Janice Walters. I've been serving um, first as the Chief Operating Officer here at the Royal Health Redesign Center and more recently its Executive Director, but really leading the work um, of the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model since 2018. Um, so prior to that, I was a former uh, hos rural hospital leader. I spent 10 years helping to run a critical access hospital here in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, we served a four county area, had 10 rural health clinics. So I approach this work very much um, through, I would say, the operational lens. Um, I was able to spend a little bit of time um, working for a large integrated delivery network here in the center part of Pennsylvania after having moved out of the rural community for about a year and a half. And that really um, gave me an appreciation for the payer community. Um, so where I sit in this work is really, I say the convener. Um, as the Rural Health Redesign Center, we work with our hospital, much like the Green, Count Care, Green Count Mountain Care Board, but with a little bit different governance structure, we sit here and work um, I, I lead the work between the hospitals, the payers, the state government, um, and then other partners such as hospital associations and vendor partners and all of that. So I view ourselves as the convener um, of all of the parties uh, that are required to, to do work, um, such as the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model um, and, and the AHEAD framework. Um, I also think it's important, I'm not a, a lifelong healthcare career professional. Um, so I also bring to this work um, you know, I would say an industry lens from two other industries. So uh, prior to healthcare, um, I actually did manufacturing um, for about seven years. And then I was in the communications industry, helping to uh, do accounting and all of that for a communications, a large communications uh, company. And so um, it really allows me to bring a different lens to healthcare. And so I entered healthcare right before the Affordable Care Act, right before value-based became, you know, I, I would say the terms of the day. Um, and I can tell you, you know, entering healthcare, um, it is an archaic system, unlike um, my experience in any other industry. Um, and I can share a little bit uh, more about that later and, um, and how I think we need to use some of the ind other industry principles within the healthcare environment if we're actually gonna solve some of these problems moving into the future. Um, I actually fell into healthcare. Um, as is very common in rural communities, uh, people, you know, when, when uh, I watched all un other industry leave, uh, the communications company that I worked for actually was part of one of the companies back in the early 2000s, all the scandals, the Enrons of the day. Um, I actually worked for one of those companies, saw it spiral into bankruptcy and entered healthcare when there really was no other jobs left in the community. And so it wasn't all that glamorous. It was, you know, hey, you know, you're willing to still drive to Cowdersport for work and my response was what's the job? Um, and so my pathway into healthcare was not glamorous. Um, so as I sit here today, I'm, I'm, um, I count it a privilege to lead such significant work as it relates to rural health payment reform. Um, and as I've already touched upon, because I have that diverse background, I think I do bring, um, you know, uh, a lot of how I approach my work is using basic business pr principles within a macro system framework. Um, and recognizing that the hospital, the health system is part of a much broader uh, macro system that needs to work together. 
Um, and, and that's the thought process that really guides a lot of my work. Um, and I also would describe myself as a pretty pragmatic uh, person um, in terms of how to take how to take concepts from from folks like uh, Carrie, um, you know, the researchers out there all doing all of this work, but then how to take that from concept to reality, really operations and implementation, I would say, is where my strengths lie. Um, so I've had the pleasure of getting to know a number of you. Um, I see familiar faces on, on this call, and so it's great to see familiar faces. And I've got to know many of you over the last couple of years, especially in the height of the pandemic, having calls uh, from the various states of, hey, what are you doing, um, you know, as it relates to your program in the midst of the pandemic. But as I've got to know all of you, understanding where you're at on your journey, you know, a couple of things came to mind based on, you know, the questions and what we were asked to present as, as part of this portion of the agenda is, you know, our thoughts uh, for my thoughts for Vermont uh, based on the lens of experience that, that I bring, which is really, you know, running the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model, administrating a global budget framework in a rural setting. Um, and so understanding where you've been. And, and now where you're trying to migrate to, you know, one of the things, and, and some of this for the folks that have heard me or have engaged with me before, you will hear some of the same things repeated, but, you know, from a Medicare perspective, you really are going into this from a point of strength. You've already been able to achieve a lot from a Medicare, you know, cost uh, per beneficiary, thinking about the starting point. And, you know, my encouragement to you is if you do pursue an AHEAD program, you really need to leverage that. Um, especially given, uh, you know, the, the overarching goals of the AHEAD program is, is really cost savings. And so, you know, um, that would be my, my, my first. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit more to that through the, through the lens of my experience. Um, but leveraging your strong position um, really has to be uh, first and foremost as well as I think being able to define a couple of things. And so I've heard affordability mentioned. I know as I've engaged with you, um, Carrie, used it in part of her statements. Um, I, I think Bruce might have mentioned it in his, but affordability, it's like, how how is that defined and when will you know if you've achieved it? So I think it's really important to be able to identify the end. Um, you know, as we're developing programs, it's like, what are we looking to achieve? And is this the right tool to help us get there? And so I've heard that term affordability. What does it actually mean for whom and, and how will you know um, when you arrive there? Um, much to the point that Bruce just made, one of the things that concerns me as I look at ahead too, and again, lessons learned, on our journey, as well as now, um, what I'm hearing from my payer community is as we, like you, are figuring out what comes next. Um, you know, we're very much in that same situation, but the global budget is for the hospital. But we know there's a continuum of care. And so how are we going to align this whole continuum of care? The focus is on the hospital because that's where a lot of the dollar is spent but ensuring that you have that incentive there across. So what is the incentive for the primary care provider to stay open at past five o'clock and not send people to the emergency room? And again, you've had your a ACO infrastructure in place for a while now. So you might be further ahead on some of this than other states, but again, aligning that incentive um, to make sure that it really is, it's the continuum um, you know, and, and as uh, Bruce has already said too, real-time actionable data. I mean, that's one of the things that we don't, we don't in Pennsylvania have the robust infrastructure that you do. So, um, you know, we've had to build some of that, but even our hospitals are staying today. Every, every bit of data I get is old. And so we're trying to chase an actionable, real-time actionable data, um, you know, to manage patient populations and all of that. Um, so they would be my opening you know, remarks as it relates to, you know, um, high-level things to consider, but would like to share with you why like what's informed uh, some of that um, from my lens. So, you know, again, ahead, um, you know, the, the, the work that ahead is trying to achieve is really tackle the cost, get cost under control. And, and you know, a global budget could be a mechanism to do that. Um, but for us in Pennsylvania, again, rural was our mission. Rural is still my passion is, you know, our goal was initial goal within our program was the sustainability of rural hospitals, um, which I do believe we achieved as evidenced by improved operating margins. 
um, you know, improving the health of po rural populations. That was our second, I would say, stool to the three-legged stool. And I think we've done that as evidenced by good performance on our statewide measures. Um, you know, and then reducing the total cost of care, again, as evidenced by we we're well within our total cost of care guardrails. Um, CMMI will tell you what we didn't achieve is hospital savings. And I know we have colleagues here from Maryland. Um, some of my contract was actually inherited from Maryland's contract. And we started we started at very different points on our global budget journey. And, and, in, and in Maryland, it's my understanding, a huge focus was on hospital savings. So we had hospital savings, but again, if we're going to a total cost of care, total cost of care is more important. The one thing I didn't produce was hospital hospital savings, even though my total cost of care is still well within the frameworks. So all of that to tie into the point of what are you trying to achieve and and, and how will you know when you get there um, as it relates to, to the various uh, things you're trying to achieve. Um, so as it relates to methodology, um, again, having run a program like this um, and, and served on the front line, um, I, I do want to reiterate uh, what, what Bruce has stated, you know, methodology as developed needs to de incentivize the desired behaviors. And so what, what behaviors do we want to see? What do we want changed? And our program has to make sure, as developed, needs to incentivize those behaviors. Um, you know, our methodology didn't yield broad sweeping transformation for a couple of reasons. In rural hospitals, literally, we, we wanted them to uh, redesign um, move away from services that needed volume, things like orthopedic and some of these other things. But the reality is because the financial position of our hospitals was so vulnerable that because there was a global budget adjustment, so if, if, if they gave up a service to the extent that service went elsewhere, their global budget went down. And so we found hospitals hesitant to change service lines because they literally couldn't afford to get any less in their global budget because they were still operating in, in negative margins. Um, despite, and we also did this in the midst of the COVID pandemic, which I know you folks were running your ACO in, in the midst of that as well. Um, you know, however, despite that, I will say our hospitals fully engaged in the transformation journey. They could see the value of no longer having, you know, let me focus on keeping people out of my emergency room. Um, so it was enough, the incentives were enough that they did fully embrace the journey of population health and wellness. The one thing our methodology did not necessarily support, and again, some of this was taken from Maryland, um, is when you have a global budget adjustment down for a service line and the hospital's already losing money, um, you know, and, and still losing money. So again, an important point is while our hospitals improved operating margins through our program, that does not mean they were posting positive operating margins. So even within the global budget framework, because of the cost, ours is a revenue only model. And so, you know, we, I think there's got to have um, some some appreciation for cost um, as, as part of this if we truly want to get hospitals to sustainability. So again, um, what are we looking to incentivize? Um, you know, the the our, our hospitals did see enough of an incentive to fully embrace the value-based journey and took that transformation plan very, very seriously. Um, maybe not at a level we had hoped, again, because of the global budget adjustments. Um, and again, one of the positive things that I think in AHEAD, you know, we can clearly see the, the experience of our program in the AHEAD framework. As I read through the AHEAD methodology, can see our lessons learned. Um, and so, again, um, we didn't provide any additional funding for social determinants of health and care management. So seeing that in the AHEAD framework to actually give upfront investment, I think is a very good change. We didn't have it. And therefore our hospitals had to use money within the global budget to fund these things. And it really did stall um, some of the innovation. So while the hospitals were very willing, um, identifying the, the resources needed to do it um, is, is often where our hospitals struggled. Um, so, Going back to a, a comment that uh, Carrie made, um, you know, our methodology is complicated um, and uh, I am all for simpler approaches if they can be achieved, because even at our stage, you know, coming into the final years of the program, our hospitals and payers are still struggling to actually identify and understand the calculations. There's a lot of black box magic that happens. And, you know, at least in fee for service, it's a fairly, you know, simple 
you, you, you provide the service, you build the service. There's a lot of complication that has come in because we know that's not sustainable. So suddenly you have all of these extra payments and everything coming in, but at least at the highest level, you know, you provide the service, you get paid. Um, and, and so, you know, simple, simpler is better, um, but I will say we created it. We, we started out to do something simple. We created a very complicated, um, I would say machine. Part of that quite transparently was needed in order to recruit hospitals. In order for me to get hospitals to sign up, there were certain things we had to work into our methodology specific around market shift, market shift calculations. Um, I'm pleased to see some of the language within the ahead. While we don't necessarily know the how, we can see that you know um, we don't wanna be doing these adjustments unnecessarily. So what are thresholds? What makes sense um, when we do these some of, some of these calculations? Um, but again, I now have data to say, because I also will say um, our methodology did not necessarily um, create the most predictable revenue because of some of the adjustments that we were doing, um, you know, as it relates to market shift and, you know, uh, retrospective reconciliations with prospective adjustments. Um, so, so anyways, a lot, a lot of detail I could go in there. I won't bore you with it. But again, simpler is always better. Um, of course, there will always be some level of complications. But six years in with the global budget, our hospitals and payers are still scratching their head a little bit. And, and why that's a concern to me is that it undermines trust. And it also provides the opportunity for to say, well, it's a third party vendor, you know, and, and I would say, um, if I don't understand it, it's their fault. And, and it just creates, uh, uh, it can create a contentious um, environment. So my, I've got four bull bullets, elements for success um, that I offer all of you. Aligned objectives, i.e. goals, for all stakeholders that can collectively identify what, what the work is we are trying to achieve together. Can everybody speak to them? Does everybody actually know? Does everybody agree to the goals? Um, and again, defining how we know when we're going to arrive. So for example, what does affordability mean? How will you know when it's achieved? Um, also, how will the global budget input infrastructure help you achieve this? Do you see the pathway? Um, my advice would be design the program based on the objectives, not the other way around. Um, Ensure there's a value statement, a value proposition for every stakeholder at the table. So whether that's the payers, whether that's the hospitals, whether that's you, the Green Mountain Care Board, whether you're DHS or AHS there in Vermont, like what's the value proposition of this work? Because the only way it's going to be sustainable long term outside of mandate, quite frankly, outside of other regulatory metrics or, or measures, the only way it's going to be successful is if people can see the value proposition, the what's in it for me the with them um, as a stakeholder. And again, if you're going voluntary, that's work that needs to be done. If you're using mandates, maybe some of this becomes less important, but it's still very important that everybody can see the value of why you're doing this collectively. Um, and then uh, ensuring trust amongst the partners. So, so again, they would be my final my final thoughts to you um, as you're on this journey is can can you describe what you're trying to achieve and and can you define how ahead is going to help you get there or another whatever the path is what's the path to help you get there i'll turn that back to you great thank you janice really appreciate your comments um i'll turn it now over to william henderson and we'll wrap up with robert murray thank you Thank you. Uh, I'm William Henderson. I am Deputy Director of Medical Economics for the Health Services Cost Review Commission uh, here in Maryland um, and um, am responsible, among other things, for our uh, discussions and point person with uh, CMS and do a lot of analytics to support the rest of uh, our team here and also responsible for our value-based programs. Um, so touch most of the aspects of the model here in, in Maryland. Um, by background, I'm actually an accountant. I uh, started uh, as an auditor working mainly in the healthcare space, um, did some consulting work. I then spent about 15 years in the payer space at a national managed care plan. Uh, and then I came back to Maryland um, to work at the HSCRC, was recruited back here by folks I knew from my accounting days. Um, and, and I think 
one of the reasons, the, the, the big reason I came back was it felt like having spent 15 years in the national payer space, and although I was based in Maryland, our, our business was almost entirely outside Maryland, it, you know, I really felt like we had a system that didn't work, right? Uh, that ultimately we've got uh, a lot of decisions being made about care in terms of cost and quality and efficiency, um that are made uh, a long way away from the patient and i think generally the, the best decisions are made closest to the patient by somebody with uh, a full set of information um and that a lot of the strategies that payers use are uh, you know well-meaning hopefully um but are also ultimately removed from the patient right that the the, the insurer is a long way away from the patient um, and so, so I came back to Maryland because one of the things I thought was interesting is the the model here and the global budget really tries to move uh, decision making closer to the patient in that it gives the hospitals a stake in some of those decisions that they don't have right now. Now, the hospital is also not the doctor, uh, but they are, I think, a little bit closer to the insurance company. Um, and that if we can align their incentives into the right kind of decision making that had promise. Uh, and I was really excited about a chance to work in a in a model that um, that had some promise. Uh, and now I'm you know five years of maturity from that. Uh, I have some of the same thoughts, uh, and and I think the promise is definitely there. But I think we are all still trying to figure out uh, how to fully um, capture capture that promise and and you know agree with with many of Janice's uh, comments on that. So I'm going to go through you know I think three areas that are are fairly critical I think to us in terms of how you design global budgets and and how they operate. Um, I think the first one, and I've already hinted about that, is is in my mind the global budget should be founded with a somewhat different vision for the role of the hospital in the community, um, and that right historically the hospitals have been focused on delivering care to sick people, and the one of the great things about the global budget is it changes their incentive where suddenly every time somebody walks through the door, you could say the hospital has failed from a financial point of view, right? Uh, and so suddenly the hospital has an interest in, in a healthy community, a community that can seek uh, care in, in the primary care office or in an urgent care and not have to come to the ED, uh, you know, a community that has adequate access to things like ambulatory surgery centers and infusion centers, which are convenient for the patient and, and work in a vast majority of the situations, rather than pulling as many patients as they can into sort of the, the hospital infrastructure. Um, and so I think there's a lot of promise in that. And I think hospitals are generally well positioned in that, particularly in rural communities, right? The hospital is often the largest employer in town or the second largest employer in town. They're connected to to the leadership uh, within the community. They're a big player. They have big pockets compared to everybody else, certainly. Uh, and therefore, if you look at how um, a hospital operates, again, particularly in a rural or, or smaller community, right, they're in one of the strongest positions to really promote community on uh, uh, community health on a, on a broad basis. And I will say some of our hospitals have done an, an excellent job with this in terms of thinking about their role as uh, promoting health in the community. And the global budget really is just uh, what makes that possible because suddenly they can focus on how do I keep the community healthy and not how do I maximize the number of surgeries I'm doing in my OR. Um, I think there's challenges in that revised role for hospitals. One, right, culturally, that is not what hospitals have done historically. Historically, they have been focused on treating patients. They will tell you they are not public health experts. Uh, you know, they've got physicians who potentially aren't on a global budget, who are still reimbursed on a, a fee-for-service basis and therefore not aligned with the, that motive that the, the global budget brings. Um, and, uh, you know, I think ultimately some of them will a little hesitant to take that role, right? It requires a change in mindset and and frankly, you know, hospital leadership has been brought up to lead hospitals. And, and I think the things we have valued in hospital leadership include things like building really nice big new buildings and and recruiting the maximum possible physician staff and, and uh, things that I think all have value, but which take a very different spin if you're going to ask the hospital to take the role under a global budget of a, a community health leader. Uh, so I think that's my first area that that you know I don't think we have really solved either is is how do you 
uh, understand what what you're expecting your hospitals to do under a global budget model and and whether they are capable and 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 willing uh, and able to able to do that. And I think we've had mixed mixed uh, experience. Uh, I think the second thing is um, the role of global budgets in um, managing volume. And I think on paper, there's a really nice relationship here, right? Because when you think about the more rural hospitals whose challenges is dropping volume, the global budget protects them from that. Um, and, that and that's the goal of that, to keep some stable funding and, and hopefully allow them to continue to provide a baseline of services. Because some of the challenge with hospital services, right, is it's not all volume driven, right? You, No matter how much volume you have, if you're the only provider for many miles, you need to have a 24 hour ED. Um, so, so giving them that protection is, I think, important on the volume downside. And then the theory would be on the on the other direction. It provides a different incentive because the hospital doesn't gain by just finding more and more volume. So hopefully they think a little bit differently about how they're relating to their physicians and how they're relating to their patients in terms of uh, readmissions, right? Which I think everybody's aware of is really the sort of slam dunk of global budget budget policy because suddenly a hospital has uh, total incentive to minimize their readmissions because really there's absolutely no benefit to them to uh, to delivering care that results in an in an avoidable readmission. Um, so I think that's the nice thing about global budgets and, and volume is that it really I think manages our risks on both sides. Um, I think the challenges in that really comes down to access and how do you measure access? And a lot of the pressure we have seen is hospitals saying, "Look, uh, and this is this is more in the urban areas. Look." we're all focused on managing this volume down and it's sort of a, a com competition and who's making sure that the patient can actually see get the services they need right because there are clearly services people need uh, you know we don't want anybody to have to go to the ed but people do need to go to the ed some of the time and so i think uh, an area that we're really looking at is focusing under our head and it's it's surfaced in places on, is how do we measure access and how do we incorporate access measures into monitoring our global budgets? I think the same can be said on, on the rural side. It's a little bit of a different challenges, but, but having access measures so that you understand, um, you know, where are we pushing too far? Uh, are, if we are encouraging people to decrease volume all the time, how do we make sure we haven't gone too far? How do we make sure people can still get to a hospital or a physician when they need to? Um, so I think we've really seen it. It works great in volume, but you need those those guardrails. And, and I think we see the guardrails ultimately being as effective access measures. Uh, I think the third theme, and Janice actually hit this one quite a lot, is this whole tension between complexity and, and simplicity. And you know, GBR, global budgets, they, they do introduce new complexity. And I find that you know, people make the mistake of thinking that the opposite of complexity is simplicity, but in most of these things, the opposite of complexity is unfairness, right? That is almost invariably why our policies end up getting complex, is because we start with a simple policy and somebody says, but wait, that doesn't work for the hospital in XYZ situation. Uh, and so then we add a clause that says, in that situation, we'll do something else. And then somebody else points out that, well, that doesn't work in a situation. The pandemic, right, created a whole ton of new situations. Um, so I think, you know, there, I don't think there is a simple answer that is also fair and, and sustainable. Uh, so you have to accept a certain level of complexity, and that requires a certain level of, in, of investment. Uh, you know, I think the good news is it's probably easier for a smaller state than it would be for a larger state. You know, if you're talking about California, I would guess the amount of different uh, circumstances they have is exponentially larger than than we might have in Maryland or or you might have in Vermont. So I think that complexity is perhaps a little bit more manageable. But I think it is important to communicate to people that look, if you know, if there was a simple, easy answer to to managing healthcare, we would have already done it. Right? Any system is going to have some level of complexity. Uh, and and I think you know fee for service has a ton of complexity uh, to echo a point Janice made. We've kind of got used to it, and that's how hospitals are used to managing and physicians and so on. But there's a ton of complexity in a fee for service model. It's just hidden in different in different corners. And I try and remember people remember when people are concerned about well the global budgets do this or the global budgets do that. Well, let's remember the counterfactual here is not the perfect healthcare system, right? The counterfactual is a system that we have 
in 50 states and have had for years and has generated you know cost growth that i think most most observers would say is is unsustainable and at the same time you know fails to provide uh high quality care to a, a fair proportion of the to the population so uh, i i would encourage people as you talk to them you know to be be careful there are certainly gaps in global budgets and there's certainly blind spots uh, but but again, we're not comparing this to a perfect system and we need to evaluate the different systems and understand which one has the best combination of of merits for us and not act like any new system must must jump over some impossibly high hurdle to be worth it. Um, so I think I'll wrap there and I'll turn it back to Alita. Thank you so much. Um, and our last but not least, Robert Murray. Hi, thanks very much. I'd like to share my screen. Uh, hopefully this will work. Um, and it's not allowing me to pull up the tabs. Let me see. Maybe this will work. Can you see this? No. I'm no, sorry, no. I always have trouble with teams. <laughs> um, there should be a little box next to the leave button. Oh, it gets me in trouble. They're too close together. Um, yeah, I see it. Oh, but, see uh, uh, now it's asking me to share maybe if I do my window. Oh, here we go. Okay. Can you see that now? Nope. Not quite. I think if you click window and then if you selected the. Yeah, I do. I'm on window and then I'm selecting. I'm selecting my uh, PowerPoint and Teams won't allow me to call it up. <laughs> if you'd like to send me your slides, I can pull it up. OK, yeah, I'm sorry. I just thought I had problems with Teams. Um, let me let me send you. Unfortunately, it's animated, so you're gonna have to. So let me let me just send it to you. I should have done that to begin with. Um, okay, I apologize. And then then I can get started, and then you can call it up um, as we're getting through this. Um, You want to start with an intro while I wait for? Yeah, I apologize. Okay. I just I can't I can't chew gum and walk at the oh. same time. So <laughs> I understand. Um, Thank you. Yeah. All right. So I sent it to you. Um. A anyway, well, uh, intro. I'll be very brief here. Um. As you'd mentioned before, I was uh, the third executive director of the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission. Um. And then, uh, Elena, when you got the uh, the deck, let me know. You can pull it up. You'll have to go through it though it is animated um so but uh so since leaving when i was at the commission it implemented we had some problems with volume growth um in the 2000s period because we'd gotten rid of our, our key volume constraint methodology in the 90s um and we tightened down on rates in the late 90s early 2000s because we were in danger of losing our waiver and the combination of getting rid of the volume uh, adjustment, which really constrained hospitals' ability to increase volumes under the fee-for-service structure, um, and tightening on rates resulted in hospitals just exploding in their volumes um, across the board. Cases, tests, uh, ancillary services, outpatient services. I mean, it was really remarkable. We, we wrote an article about it. But uh, and so, in response to that, we tried to put in uh, uh, bring back the volume adjustment uh, mechanism, but also um, implement global budgets for the rural hospitals. So we started that in 2009. Um, uh, the basic idea there was to try to do a regional type of system, put the hospitals that are more in the rural areas under global budgets, and then uh, manage global budgets more regionally um, using the authority of the HSCRC. So that's really, I guess, the primary 
area of expertise that I have is in setting up those types of, of models. Back in 2014, 2015, I also was consulting for the Green Mountain Care Board and proposed a model very much like the model that I'm talking about based on flexible global budgets. Um, but uh, the state instead decided to go the, the, the way of uh, using ACOs to try to create a population-based uh, payment model. So, uh, Elena, I, have you? I still don't have it in my inbox. I'm... Um, Sorry, we should have tested this out. I... <laughs> um, let me just make sure it was sent. Yeah, I did send it. So let me see again if I can possibly pull up the. I, I got it. So oh, okay. To pull it up. Again, I apologize for this. Don't worry. I think. Um, I think Microsoft sh should be eliminated as a high tech company. Um, but anyway, that's my bias. Um, so just pull it up whenever you can, and then I'll just ask you to go through it, you know, click by click, if you could. Maybe do presentation mode. Great. Okay, um, just advance through it. And so initially, I just want to provide my bias, biases with regard to payment reform. I, I think it's still the prices that are problematic. Maybe go to the next point. Um, it, so it's the focus needs to be on price and constraining price and spending growth. Um, and in doing so, setting constraints you address the key market failure, which is non-competitive hospital markets or provider markets generally, but particularly hospital markets. Um, and by setting a constraint on price, um, you, you have the ability to provide incentives for hospitals to control their costs, to manage their costs. Uh, the experience that I had in Maryland is they hospitals, when they face a constraint, they do manage their costs and they improve their operational efficiency. And under global budgets, they have the additional ability to remove waste and unnecessary services to generate savings um, uh, moving forward. So I, my, our, my thesis is that the big problems in healthcare are caused by market failure, non-competitive uh, hospital markets, and also moral hazard, and also the tax preference for insurance premiums. Those two factors desensitize insurers and patients to the cost implications of, of price growth. So you have this perfect storm nationally of consolidated hospital markets, which are non-competitive, tremendous pricing power in combination to an insurance system that desensitizes the cost implications of price growth, which just feeds right into the pricing uh, power of hospitals, the highly cons consolidated hospitals. Uh, just if you go to the next couple of slides, Market failure, if you think of classical economics, market failures require government intervention. And in Maryland, the HSCRC, uh, the, the legislature realized that, that they needed an agency like the HSCRC to address these market failures. But the, the quid pro quo was that only intervene to address market failures and try to avoid unnecessary interventions, which is very difficult for race setting agencies because they always want to overregulate. My other bias is that voluntary payment systems don't work. Uh, you can look back historically, you can look at histor uh, voluntary arrangements at state level, the federal level, at the Carter Initiative that turned into a voluntary initiative, they don't work. It's like having a voluntary tax system. Um, these sorts of things just are not effective. Um, the next point, population-based payment is a great ultimate goal um, and but it's something that's highly complex. It can only be implemented by systems, closed corporate systems like a Kaiser or a system like the Israeli system, which is is enforced by rate regulation and other regulatory guidelines. Um, but you need extreme integration, clinical integration uh, uh, through ownership of the insurance function, the provider function. ACOs are not going to get you there. The, the next point. I think states have the best opportunity to set up uh, what I think is required, which is mandatory rate setting systems to, to address the key healthcare issues, is it primarily price and spending growth. The next point, the key to change as been discussed before is changing the incentives, but also to, to ease the transition by initially preserving some of the key 
administrative and operational features of the existing system. And so the model that we developed for Vermont tried to do both. The next point. Um, well, I think that Vermont is uniquely positioned to really have a, a very, very effective um, health reform and spending approach because of its re the regional nature of, of the uh, state. If you could go to the next slide and just click through the this slide. Um, you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. This is a slide that we prepared for some of our presentations before. But just, uh, Elena, just go click through some of these things. So, um, so I think the great thing about Vermont is you've got these regional healthcare systems where the populations are naturally mapped to hospitals. M many of them, most of them are rural, um, but uh, it's, it's a very positive basis for creating an overall global budget system. Just keep clicking through if you could. Um, so again, I thought that Vermont was uh, very uniquely positioned. Um, the Rochester and Finger Lakes uh, model was very much of a regional model. I had a lot of characteristics that I think that are very uh, uh, positive and opportune. It, it was a simple model. Uh, it was formula based um, and it was very effective for the period 1980 to 1987. And it was, uh, it was implemented under the auspices of the Healthcare Financing Administration, which is the administration that ran Medicare, different name, uh, but they have experience with these types of demonstrations. Go to the next slide. So some of the characteristics of uh, an effective system operated by a small independent agency. This is true of the Rochester Finger Lake system. Agency had broad powers to set and update provider rights, uh, rates and other goals, primarily focusing in on this idea of constraining price growth and spending growth and, and setting constraints for hospitals to improve their operating efficiency and reduce waste. Um, agency would have strong enforcement authority, and there would be an emphasis on, if you could just click through these, establishing very clear attainable financial targets for hospitals, um, focused on formula-based rate methods that are relatively simple and well understood, um, preserving existing payment infrastructure. I'm, I'm saying that the, the model that we developed for Vermont previously it, uh, retain the existing claims processing system of Medicare, Medicaid, and the commercial payers. So they didn't need to change that. I think there's some disadvantages to the head model, which is it completely tries to change the way hospitals are paid, which is not a bad idea, but it's, it's difficult to do and it creates additional unnecessary complexity. But the locus of control is at the hospital global budget level. Um, uh, our preference is for flexible global budgets, not fixed global budgets, which we implemented with the rural hospitals in 2008, or 2009, 2010, and exist there currently. There are a myriad of uh, other adjustments, but I think those adjustments are largely unnecessary if you do a flexible approach as opposed to a fixed approach. Uh, next point. Um, there are flexibilities in terms of how you structure a flexibility approach. Uh, but one of the key elements of this system is mandatory participation by all hospitals and all payers. If you don't have all payers participating, they're not contributing uh, uh, appropriately or equitably to the funding of the global budget. And if you have some hospitals in, some hospitals out, you're truncating the incentives. Um, you need uniform incentives. The best way to do that is through an all payer system where everybody participates. I think there may be one more point on this slide. Uh, yeah, cooperation with payers too. In, in designing incentive-based payments for physicians to try to weave them in. There's also the potential to bring in hospital-based uh, physicians into under the global budget. Uh, go to the next slide. So just click through this very quickly. Um, um, this is an example of a, of a medium-sized rural hospital in um, Maryland, 100,000 uh, uh, population. Uh, the budget the, it was set at $250 million because that was the historical budget. Uh, and then the, the model itself, as I said, it was relatively simple. The budget is adjusted by two things. Uh, estimated cost inflation, which we use the Medicare market basket to do. So if you just, Atlantic, just click through this. Um, so the adjustment for inflation, just an example, 2.5%, an adjustment for demographic changes. So you get the new budget at 260 million, and then all the focus for the hospitals to control costs, uh, th that $255 million, and by, by improving efficiency and also reducing unnecessary service use and waste, you can control costs and then uh, keep clicking. Uh, you can generate a, a profit and so that you have a situation, just 
click through this, please. Um, where uh, unnecessary utilization and unnecessary inefficiency are sources of financial sustainability for the hospital. If they focus on, on removing or reducing those, they can generate surpluses and profits, and then hopefully reinvest those profits um, into uh, population health and other uh, uh, remedies to, to reduce unnecessary use and support population health in their regional communities. Uh, if you could click through, I think I have a couple. So unlike Maryland, we propose a flexible glo global budget approach, uh, which it pays on the basis of variable costs, but preserves uh, fu funding for hospital fixed costs if volumes decline. And I can go into more detail about that. But Elena, if you could go to the next slide. So this is, to just click through this as well. Um, you have extremes fee-for-service model, you have on the other end of the spectrum, fixed global budgets. There are, we know the obvious problems with fee-for-service encourages unnecessary volume growth because marginal revenue for each service a hospital provides is in excess of the marginal cost. Fixed global budgets goes to the other extreme. I believe that fixed global budgets, even though we recommended them initially for the rural hospitals in Maryland, they provide too much financial risk for small rural hospitals. They also uh, incentivize stinting on care. Uh, and so as a result, you get reductions in elective services uh, that are provided by hospitals and also high uh, ED wait times, which both of which I, I believe characterize Maryland currently. Um, uh, by contrast, in the middle, um, Flexible global budgets, as I said, pays on the basis of hospital variable costs. It means that you don't need to have a complex, as complex a, a mechanism to address market shifts. Um, and you know, the idea of keeping this thing as simple as possible, but it provides predictable revenue for hospitals, in particular small rural hospitals, because A, it doesn't provide excessive level of financial risk. Under fixed blood budget, you get something that's unexpected in terms of utilization, morbidity, or mortality changes, and it can blow the hospital's budget out of the water and create huge financial solvency problems. Under a flexible global budget, they're paid on the basis of volumes and their variable costs, but they also have uh, a funding that's guaranteed to cover their fixed costs should volumes decline. If you could keep clicking. So again, it's a middle ground approach. I think it's something that's softer, gentler, and it's more uh, a, a suitable for a state like Vermont that has a, a mixture of larger hospitals and rural facilities. Go to the next slide. So just generally, this is the concept, which is uh, uh, you've got the current trend, which is in blue. Uh, setting global budgets gives the state the ability to set a hard ceiling cap in terms of revenue growth on a per capita basis, and then click in the next, um, you get a lower trajectory, you realize uh, per capita uh, savings over time. And you can, as a state, you could try to equate that with growth and st a gross state product to ensure that the, the health system, the hospital system is affordable moving forward. Go to the next slide. So key success factors, uh, the regional orientation of the model, cooperation with regional actors like payers, uh, the primary care physicians, FQHCs. I think that's another advantage of Ver Vermont is that you have a very strong FQHC infrastructure in the state. Set clear financial incentives backed by strong enforcement. Again, mandatory systems work, volume voluntary systems don't. Try to set up very, very uh, straightforward, well understood uh, targets, attainable targets uh, in formula-based rate setting. These are all characteristics of the uh, uh, Rochester and Finger Lakes model, but otherwise avoid as a regulatory agency uh, to intervene in operational decision making of hospitals. And also avoid the tendency to uh, react, to have the squeaky wheel, wheel phenomenon and as an agency react to hospitals that complain about things. That's the, the circumstance that's existed in other rate setting states where the regulators are overly responsive. They react to complaints by the industry. And then over time, they layer on this change to that change. And the system becomes so complex as it did in New York and New Jersey. And I would argue, argue to a certain extent, Maryland, that even the payers and the hospitals don't understand the incentives. So regulatory agency needs to resist the tendency to constantly change the system. Um, it's a macro regulatory model, not a micro regulatory model or focus on aggregate revenues or compliance. And if you have strong uh, legislation to control uh, both rates and also aggregate budgets, you can achieve 
uh, savings as intended. Again, formula-based. You need Medicare and Medicaid to participate. If you could continue clicking, Elena. The two dangers to rate setting, um, regulatory failure and regulatory capture. I've written about both of these. Um, but uh, this approach is structured to avoid regulatory fa uh, failure, which is the excess complexity that is a tendency of, of, of rate regulators in, uh, going back his historically. I think there's one other bullet. Um, and street, you can have structural protections to the rate agency to avoid regulatory capture. We advocate a public utility model of rate setting. Go to the next slide. So again, I think Vermont has the key ingredients. You've got a small agency. Uh, you can adopt a, a public utility approach um, where all deliberations are in public and, um, and, and transparent interactions and a methodology development and uh, debate. Uh, Act 48 back in 2011 gave the Green Mountain Care Board rate setting authority. So thus, you already have that. It could be modified or perhaps enhanced if necessary. Um, mandatory rate setting also can be avoided to design to avoid ERISA preemptions. That's not the case if you try to structure uh, payment the way um, the, the head model has, has recommended like per capita amounts uh, for all payers, including commercial payers. Those will be challenged by ERISA plans. Uh, but if you set up a system that's uh, structured the way we had recommended, it will avoid an ERISA challenge. Um, and you can collect data directly from hospitals, so you don't have to go and get the data and be preempted by ERISA, uh, get the data that you need, because you largely need hospital-level data. And keep going, Elena. The regional orientation is, is a huge advantage for the state. Um, and so the state should study uh, the Rochester Finger Lakes demonstration. I think it has the characteristics that I mentioned. It's relatively simple. It was formula based. It set targets and standards, and it didn't futz with the, the rate setting methodologies excessively over time. So the system stayed pretty straightforward and the incentives were very clear for the hospitals. And it was, it was hugely successful. Um, there was involvement by the State Department of Health in New York. Uh, keep going, Elena. The regional models focusing on regional health care needs. And then so that just have you a little display of um, uh, the transition slide. So anyway, that's that's the final slide I had, and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Sorry for the logistical problems. Um, maybe next time we can use Zoom. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate everyone's comments. Um, so I'll open it up now for board questions and Chair Foster, I'll let you manage your your people. <laughs> no, you nailed it. That's all you got to do. Good job. I'll, I'll go last. So any board members, please, for the floor, ask anything you want. All right, I guess I'll go first. I got a whole bunch. Um, I don't know who they're for, but I'll just kind of go through them. Um, the first one I had was, um, I think a couple of you made the point about the amount of money or providers or insurers that are in global budgets. Uh, currently, we have two hospitals that have, well, maybe more than two because UVM was more than one hospital, but a couple hospitals that have expressed interest. And so far, it's not clear if insurance will be in or not. Do you have a sense of how much money needs to be in the global budget to drive the changes in, in incentives that we're seeking? I'm happy to take a stab at that one. If at least from my experience, I can say, um, Owen, when we got to about the 60% revenue from a hospital's global budget, it was about, because we were an all-payer program, we've got the prominent payers in the state at the table. Um, there were, you know, COVID interrupted that. So, so the hospitals that joined at the end, um, we needed to recruit a couple. Our goal was 75 um, when we could get to 60, we could see the hospitals seeing it was worth their time to change the delivery system. So from my experience, it's roughly 60% of the hospital, hospital only. So again, not physician revenue, but 60% seem to be the tipping point for our hospitals. 
if I could just jump in really, I think it needs to be much higher than that. I mean, anytime you have truncated structures, you're going to have different incentives for different players, um, and that's going to be highly pro problematic. Um, in Rochester, they had over 90% of the revenue under the global budget, and it worked very well. In Maryland, it's 100% by, by law and regulation. So I think in the 90 to 100% level is ideal. And, and if you back much away from that, and you have some participating and some not participating, hospitals or payers, you're going to get conflicting incentives, and that's going to be highly problematic in terms of uh, responding to the key incentives established and, and achieving your goals. So just to echo, I would say 90% was our, our, our ultimate target. We didn't get there. 60% is when hospitals voluntarily chose to come to the table. So again, the more the better. So just to, you know, um, highlight what what Bob said there, you know, obviously higher is better, but for the hospitals that chose to participate, that was the tipping point. And, and if you're low, 25, 30, 40 percent, are there risks of focusing care on care that's outside the global budget? Is there a downside risk if you're too low? Yeah, well, I think you just have, again, the uh, conflicting incentives for the hospitals that are under global budgets are deciding, you know, they'll try to tr ship patients out. They may try to manage, but they have the incentive to ship patients to the hospitals that are under global budgets or freestanding centers. So you just get these conflicting incentives um, and it's highly problematic and you get tremendous leakage in the system. So again, the systems that have worked the best in the past are mandatory, are enforced by strong rate regu uh, regulatory authority and, and regulation, uh, and are all inclusive, have the majority of the participants there, so they're all operating under common incentives. And then it provides a locus of control at the regulatory agency to, to achieve their goals. And again, primarily goal would be control price growth and spending growth. Okay. Two related questions. Um, right now, Dr. Hamery and his team are working hand in hand with the state on hospital transformation plans to make sure we have the right footprint and available um, care where we need it, transportation, all these various components. And then we're also simultaneously looking at and evaluating global budgets. And to me, it seems like there could be interaction between those two things, maybe even beneficial to do a global budget first or to do the transformation first or simultaneously do both. I was kind of wondering what the expert panel thought about that process. And the recommendations from Dr. Hamry are going to include a whole swath of things, such as potentially focusing care in particular areas or improving transportation or whatever it might be. So I was wondering what you guys thought on that. Bob, do you want to start? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't want to dominate. But uh, yeah, I think you can do them simultaneously. And I think they're both very important, very crucial. That's one of the great things about the Pennsylvania model is these transformation plans. Because one thing you can do with a mandatory rate setting system is the agency can build in additional amounts to help finance care management uh, initiatives at the hospital level. So you could you can actually fund um, then jumpstart a model like this, but it's very important to have a plan and to have strings attached to the additional funding that you provide to hospitals. Otherwise, they'll spend it the way they've traditionally spent it, which may not be uh, focused on, on the goals of the, the new model. Um, so those care transformation plans are very important and need be, be linked back to additional financing that are provided initially to jumpstart a population-based model like this uh, for hospitals. I'll add that I was thinking that might be what you would do with some of the initial payments, like the grant type payments in the AHEAD model was to work on some of those infrastructure issues. So I think there would be interaction effects from having both simultaneously. Yeah, and I would agree with that because it was the global budget that allowed our hospitals to actually start focusing on the transformation, the, the care management, you know, social determinants of health, trying to keep people out of the hospital. Um, again, my lens is rural and, you know, they really couldn't afford to do that before, but the global budget allowed them, you know, to build 
um, utilization registries to identify, you know, those that had a lot of ED utilization and really, again, pragmatic approaches to understand why are they coming into the emergency room? What's the condition? Um, and it truly was the transformation plan. So to, to quote one of my CEOs, again, we, we attracted in a voluntary program, I would say the forward thinking leaders. Um, but one of the things that he said was for the first time he felt he was brought to the table as a partner on the population health journey versus a cost center. But really, you know, it, the, the, the global budget and the required transformation brought him to the table as a partner in the journey versus, again, the, the viewed cost center um, that historically the hospital has been viewed as. So, it, Bruce? Yeah, well, I, I guess, no, I, I think it's a it's a good discussion and, and very worthwhile. Um, you know, I guess maybe a couple of points would be helpful. One, there's only one county in Vermont that has a population of 100,000 folks. Most of them are really 25,000. As you've noted, largely rural, lots of social determinants of health issues um, to be um, uh, addressed. Uh, many of the hospitals are spending part of their budgets on some of these issues. Now, in fairness, I visited every hospital in Vermont within the last three months. And some of the folks are saying, I'm now looking at cutting those because I can't make my margin. So, you know, I, I think that may be an advantage to global budgets. I guess question though is, um, many of the smaller hospitals are running an inpatient census of 10 with two of them who don't need to be there because they're waiting for a mental health bed or something. Um, the only hospital, uh, I've heard from a couple of the bigger ones, that they may have a, a variable cost that's 5%, which in their budgets would represent a lot of money. Uh, now, I see you, but that's what they're telling me. The other thing I'm wondering about, particularly with the small rural ones, is how much of that budget is really flexible, right? Because if they're having to keep an ED visit uh, room open, um, you know, in a sense, volumes immaterial if they're staffing it. And to some degree, the nurse patient ratios on the inpatient side uh, affect that. So I'd be very interested in how those issues um, have been addressed, are being addressed, could be addressed with a global budget. Um, and I, you know, I think you commented on how those budgets are set, um, which makes, um, you know, a great, a great deal of sense. Because I know one of the concerns of the hospitals is that as those budgets are rebased based on their um, inpatient, their uh, uh, budget, uh, their dollars that that they will go down over time. Um, I guess the other question related to that is I ran a one of the original PGP demo projects back in about 2006, and we had persistent problems with the Medicare adjustments of expected cost, and so how how that might be addressed. Well, I don't know. I mean, with regard to variable costs and the flexible budget, you can adjust the fixed variable cost relationship. We recommended for the small rural hospitals to structure it so such that costs were payments were on the basis of hospitals uh, fixed and variable costs being more like 80% fixed, 90% fixed for the small rural hospitals, uh, 20, 10, 20% variable. Uh, okay. So you can adjust things. You don't wouldn't titrate it you know, individually for each hospital, but for the rural hospitals, okay. they have higher proportion of fixed costs. So the flexible budget should re reflect that. And as volumes decline, then it would provide that support to cover their fixed costs if volumes decline. For the larger hospitals, and this is the case in Maryland, um, uh, the, our, the variable costs were more like 50, 60%. And that was based on studies that we've done over time. Um, and, and that Really, that structure from 1976 to 92, where the hospitals are paid on the basis of their incremental variable costs for volume increases, was very, very successful because, because that 56% variable cost 
a, a, more or less equal the marginal revenue that they get for incremental volumes. But it wasn't as excessive as a fee-for-service system, which pays 100 cents on the dollar for marginal volumes. So it neutralizes the incentive to unnecessarily increase volumes, but then provides that funding for fixed costs if volumes decline. So that, that in a nutshell, is the genius of the volume adjustment system or a flexible global budget. And you can tailor it to a certain extent, but resist the tendency that regulators have, which would be to micro uh, structure the system, which tends to make things, as William has said, makes things, yes, potentially fairer, although that's a subjective uh, judgment, but it also tends to make rate setting systems far too complex. And then these systems collapse under their complexity over time. Uh, and also just one last point, the 100,000 people that I, that I mentioned, that was just illustrative of Maryland. You could structure that for counties that are 10, 20,000 people or the Burlington area um, and, and structure it for different size uh, regions and different size hospitals. Yeah, and I would just echo that um, I think that's one of the concerns we have in the current program as well as the ahead is there's not necessarily the, the recognition of cost um, as you're looking at just protecting the historical revenue and, and, and basing a budget on historical revenue. Um, there's not necessarily a, a correlation between revenue, historical revenue and cost. And so making sure that there's some lever in um, the global budget to account for costs and especially and we were experiencing a large inflationary, you know, inflation like we really haven't experienced for decades. And, you know, the the, the methodology has to have some um, metric in there um, versus just a historical revenue um, doesn't necessarily give you that flexibility to ensure cost cost structures um, are appropriately considered. So on that, that's very pertinent, I think, to what we have in Vermont. So if you look at the so the global budgets with the Medicare market basket, you're going to be looking at two, three, three and a half percent rate increases, right? And I can tell you our hospitals have not been able to survive on that, not even close. So in the last two year period, the system wide commercial rate increase request was over 20 percent, 21 percent, right? And then if you look at our relative pricing, our RAND pricing, we have hospitals that are, I'm going to go through them, uh, CVMC, the seventh decile, UVM, the ninth, Rutland, the eighth, Brattleboro, the eighth, Southwest, the eighth, North Country, the seventh. So very, very high relative prices, right? Very, very high rate increases, very, very high commercial rate uh, grants by the board. Despite that, we have, I think, eight or nine hospitals with negative operating margins. So my fear is on a global budget where Medicare is 2% or 3%, what we see, at least in Vermont, is that's not going to hack it in terms of enough goes, financial support. I think it goes back to something um, that one of my colleagues said earlier. I'm not sure which one, um, but it really comes down to redefining the role of the hospital. So I think part of this is presuming we're going to keep offering the same services, the same thing that we've always done, but that's not necessarily sustainable. And so having to redefine, if we're asking our hospitals to step into a new space and do things differently, I also would recommend and challenge you make sure that they're pay you're paying for the right care in the right in, in the right community. So I think, and again, I'm I'm offering you firsthand things that I'm hearing from my payer community, you know. So so we've got all of this. So while our current program only has you know some participants, you know, where we're trying to go as a state is to get all of our our, our payers at the table. Um, at this point, voluntarily, not mandatory, but they're all raising their hands saying we want to be on this journey. But that's the question they're asking. Are we sure the global budget is actually paying for the care we think our rural communities need? And so it really, to me, goes back to, you know, looking at some of, uh, you know, um, what, what Bruce put up there and some of the other things. It's like, what is the care that we want in our rural communities? Because today's fee-for-service environment, let's just call the spade the spade, does not necessarily care pay, pay for the care that we need, as, as I think it was um, Carrie, that said primary care, urgent, emergent, mental health, that's, that's not what keeps hospitals open today. What keeps hospitals open today, and, and oftentimes they're chasing, and again, a, a former hospital leader here, 
you, you, you have to balance and, and currently chase services that allow you to post the margin. So part of this work has to be, what are we actually asking our rural hospitals to do? If we want primary care, sub, you know, urgent, emergent, you know, and, and some semblance of inpatient. I, I also lead the, the National Rural Emergency Hospital Technical Assistance Center. So I work with hospitals across the country that are considering that designation. Um, and, you know, policy as it stands today, I personally don't think is what it's in the best interest of our rural communities. I think some inpatient care should be allowed in these communities for a host of reasons. But if we want, you know, a semblance of, of you know, um, swing bed care, rehab care, um, you know, all of this, that's where I'm saying design what, what you want to pay for, like figure out what you want to pay for and then design the, the program to do that. Um, because our payers, again, going back to Pennsylvania, saying I've, I've, you know, I, I, we we build a budget based on historical revenue, which includes some of these things that are not necessarily, you know, pain management clinics, orthopedics, some of the things that have historically had to be provided in order to keep the hospital open. But if we're going to fundamentally change the paradigm, we have to describe and define what we want paid for in rural communities, and so. It, 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 it's a big, like, what do we want to pay for? And does our new model actually incentivize the hospitals to move into this new space, start population health, all of that, but then we still need them to be there because people still need emergency rooms. A readmission rate of zero is not necessarily good. There are people that need to come back to the hospitals. So it's like we, we need emergent urgent, but there's other things that we could be doing within that fixed cost structure to actually move the dial on population health. So I'll get off my soapbox. I'm sorry. Uh, others? Bob and Bruce? Yeah, just a couple of quick points. One, hospitals are always going to tell you they need money, more money. And that's not true. You need to realize it's a, it's a balance. It's a quid pro quo. It's not just about hospital payment. It's also the quid pro quo is hospitals need to be under constraint so they have the incentives to manage their costs more effectively. Um, and and the, the, the beauty of a rate setting agency is you can do that gradually. You can ease them into that new structure and make these incentives very, very, very clear and reward them for, for achieving those targets and goals. Um, start and then to, to uh, uh, Janice's point to start with historical budgets the way they are. They've operated under them. Start with those as the basis of, of your hospital global budgets to begin with. And then the idea is gradual change. And if you have a rate setting system, you have the ability to differentiate updates. You can have slower rate updates for hospitals that are very high priced. Some of the ones that you mentioned that I have very high proportions of of, of Medicare uh, for the, what they're getting currently from their insur their private insurers, but you can also raise the rate of growth for hospitals that are struggling gradually over time. So you have that control if you have a mandatory system with rate regulatory authority to adjust rates, uh, set rates initially, and set global budgets, and then adjust them over time. Um, and but the idea is to impose constraints gradually, so hospitals have the uh, the uh, ability to change their systems and adapt and manage manage the care appropriately over time. Uh, Bruce, William, you're, you're, oh, you're, go ahead. Uh, Bruce, you're muted, and then William. Sorry, I, I think that's all right. I, I guess the question I have is how you align the incentives between, let's say, the various state agencies which are providing the mental health and the family support and so forth, and those FQHCs which run on a different payment system. Because you're right, I mean, the vast majority of primary care uh, in Vermont is being provided by the FQHC. So, but they have a different funding stream. So how do you get those aligned uh, with the hot, with uh, where you want the hospitals to go? We just very briefly, we did look at that. We talked to folks like in Rutland, uh, they were a very close relationship with the FQHC there. That's what was also true about Springfield, I think. Um, and, and so there are ways of extending the hospital global budget incentives to FQHCs. It's too technical to go in here, but we discussed okay. 
the, the very, very important role that the FQHCs could could play. And then also some of these other points that I mentioned about trying to encourage a primary or, or the payers, the uh, commercial payers to set up uh, incentive structures for physicians, right. so primary care physicians and also specialists. Um, and there are various you know, shared savings uh, risk arrangements that could be structured there to create models that uh, align the incentives of physicians with the global budget hospitals. Great, thank you. Sure. I was just going to add to Janice's discussion of the system you want. I think one of the things that's nice about global budgets is it forces you to think a little bit differently about what you're paying for, because reality, right, when you pay, you know, 20 percent more for another unit of inpatient service in a rural community, you're not actually it's not that that unit of service is that inpatient stay is 20 percent more expensive. Right. It's that potentially they're trying to sustain their underlying uh, infrastructure, and it's potentially that they're experiencing an uh, acuity mix. And so one of the things we're trying to move towards is understanding the cost of the infrastructure, right? If you want to have a 24-7 ED, that is going to cost you a certain amount of money. And trying to spread that over whatever number of units that the hospital happens to get isn't really a great way of thinking about it, because that is not a cost of each of those units. That is a cost of maintaining access in the community. And I think that links back to my point about understanding access. So what system do you want to have? What access do you want to guarantee? And then you're going to have a cost of that. And then you've got the cost of actually providing the service. And you almost want to separate those two things. And I think it would help normalize your cost growth into something that's more um, rational. I will say, by the way, I think CMS has underfunded inflation on, on IPPS and OPPS for the last three or four years. I think that's MedPAC keeps uh, suggesting that they um, should add more onto that. So I think that's, you know, a function of the way CMS is reimbursing uh, inflation as much as it is what the real inflation is. Great, thank you. Well, I don't want to take up more of the time because I'm sure the other board members have great questions. So thanks for indulging mine and I'll open it up to the others. Maybe I'll just hop in. Go ahead, Jess. Oh, OK. I just was going to hop in um, because I think, William, you brought up this point earlier and you just repeated it again. And it's one of, and it's a bit about um, the access and it's how important it is to monitor and measure access. And I think it also relates to a, um, a point that uh, Carrie made about mitigating unintended consequences and strategic behavior. So I'm actually going to lump the two of those questions together and say, I think access, stinting of access is a potential unintended consequence. So I'm wondering how you um, monitor that, how you suggest monitoring and measuring that one, and what other um, unintended consequences or strategic behavior should we be aware of and think about ways to mitigate if we go forward? Uh, well, I'll take, I don't know that we have a, <laughs> we are struggling with the access issue, our question ourselves now. Um, so I don't know that I have a, a silver bullet there. I think you do need to have some consensus in political leadership and healthcare leadership and so on around what, uh, you know, we have hospitals in rural areas that if I took a pure analytical point of view, I would say they just shouldn't exist, right? But that's easy for me to say, you know, sitting in Baltimore, uh, where I am, um, what's the reasonable distance for people to travel? Quality issues, you know, I think, as you all know, it's very hard, 10 bed hospital. It is hard to believe, very hard to sustain a high quality care system with that. Um, so I think those are tough choices. I don't know that we have uh, a silver bullet for that. Um, I think on the unintended consequences, uh, you have to, you know, how the, I think Bob or Janice referenced market shift, right? That's the methodology we use to shift money when volumes move, right? Because hospital A was providing this set of services, now hospital B is providing it. You need to have something robust there to make sure that you're not rewarding a hospital for simply stopping providing services. Um, so I think that's an aspect there. Um, I think the access, we have a pretty robust hospital quality program, right? So we're trying to make sure that we're monitoring, uh, you know, things like avoidable complications and so on, so that you make sure you're not uh, incenting, uh, you know, thin, thin care delivery. Uh, those are the things that occur to me off the top of my head. 
It'd be oh, really helpful oh, if you're willing to share some of that, just in the sense that I know, and Dr. Hamery is working very closely with the board on just exactly these questions of looking at what's appropriate access, what what are the essential services that need to be nearby, what could be moved to centers of excellence, how do we start to think about quality and low volumes and what should be delivered and can be delivered at a low cost, high quality level. So. Dr. Hamery's work, uh, working with all the hospitals and evaluating data is is just about that. But I'm wondering, um, you know, to the degree that you've learned from this about how you're monitoring quality and low volumes and, and those shifts. And also we're thinking about wait times and, and how we measure access via wait times. And it's been a struggle um, to, to try and do that. You know, how long are patients actually waiting for care? What's a reasonable amount? How do we gather that data? Right now it's self-reported by hospitals, but it doesn't always align with the patient experience. And I think that's understandable to the degree that they're pulling off their EMRs and their scheduling. It may not be aligned with what patients' experiences often are for accessing care. So we're, we're, we're grappling with all this. So any lessons learned from other states would be you know, greatly appreciated as we try and uh, think about this. Yeah, I think we're certainly willing to share data and I can certainly connect Dr. Hamry with uh, with our quality team and uh, with the folks here who have grappled that ED wait times is a big issue for us right now. Um, so we're definitely grappling with that one uh, as we speak. There were a couple of mentions last week as well in the provider meeting about an evaluation plan. And you could think about, I mean, you have an all payer claims data set. So looking at where people get care and where different kinds of uh, patients by different payers, different kinds of patients by different clinical settings and or severity are getting care or we're not getting care waiting. Um, we've done some measures on like time from diagnosis to surgery for rural patients using claims. Um, so there are definitely ways that you can do it using your all payer claims data set. You probably want to think about which ones you want to prioritize again to um, not make it too burdensome, but I have some ideas if you want to follow up. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I would just offer rural relevant measures. So I know there's some um, work that we've done in partnership with CMMI um, over the last couple of years to ensure that, especially with Vermont being rural, that, that we're using rural relevant measures. Um, and so there is a data set out there. Again, happy, happy to share that with you to ensure that we're measuring things that are appropriate for a rural, a predominantly rural state. So appreciate it. Thank you. Just a couple of very quick reactions. One, I think the biggest risk for a global budget is to do something too too stringent, like a fixed global budget. That puts far too much risk, particularly for the smaller smaller hospitals, financial risk um, uh, for them. On the flip side, Maryland, uh, some hospitals uh, responded too strongly to the, the fixed global budget incentives and shifted a lot of care out of the hospital to freestanding centers, and they generated huge surpluses. Um, which then forced the agency to go in and try to take money out of those hospitals, which is very, very difficult and, and uh, time consuming and problematic and uh, potential legal challenges could result from that type of thing. So the flexible approach moderates volume up or down and, and covers fixed costs, I think is a much better approach. Um, and with regard to facilities that are needed, I think uh, global budgets allow an agency to, to help transition a facility that perhaps shouldn't be there in acute care hospital to something that's more ambulatory based over time. But you can do that gradually so as not to disrupt. I mean, that's the other key rule for rate setting is make your changes gradual and, and avoid abrupt uh, disruptions to the delivery system. But you can do that under a rate setting system if you have mandatory payer and, and hospital participation and the authority over rates and revenues. The last thing with regard to, to access, which I think is very important, um, well, the, the mention, things that I mentioned that fixed global budgets tend to create incentives to stint on care. So we get high ED wait times, the reductions or increases in elective um, uh, wait times as well. But the rate setting agency in the general category of access is very positive because you could build in amounts to finance uncompensated care in the rate structures of each of the hospitals. So I know the ACA has expanded insurance. We have lower rates of uninsured currently, but there still is uncompensated care, bad debt that hospitals suffer, and rate setting systems can cover those reasonable amounts of bad debt um, because you have the flexibility through your authority to do that. 
Thank you. Just noticing the time. Um, I wanted to thank everybody uh, for coming. I've learned a lot. I've got a bunch of questions, but I think I'd like to just defer back to the chair so we have time for public comment or anybody else who wants to, to go, unless we're going to extend past three. Let's keep going. I think this is really important um, okay. and valuable. Great. So. Please. And, and I just want to so, say some of our speakers might have a hard stop at three, so feel free to pop off. But if you don't, we'd love for your continued discussion. Great. Uh, Dr. Harmory, on your slides, I think it was slide eight, had a list of conditions for success. And I wonder if you crosswalk those with the design of the AHEAD model. Does the AHEAD model promote those conditions of success, in your opinion? It's it's a great question. The answer so far is no. I am uh, I've been kind of separate from the head model. I should have that opportunity in a couple of days when they get a technical report out. But you're right, key, and uh, we have noted within um, the work that we have done so far. We're now validating with a bunch of state agencies uh, where those needs. Um, are in progress of being met and uh, what additional resource would be needed to speed that up. Because this, as you know, the projection for the head model is it comes in pretty quickly. Um, yeah. yeah. So, thank you. That's been my read of it too. Um, this next one I think is uh, for Janice and, and Bob mostly, but uh, each of you have made statements to the effect that um, we need to design the program around our objectives, not the other way around. Um, and the problems that we face in our state are rising, rapidly rising commercial prices. We have low utilization rates and we are a low uh, cost state for Medicare. Um, so, if I were to design a program that addressed those three things, would I arrive at the AHEAD model? Bob, I see you shaking your head. Janice, I'm Bruce, I see you shaking yours. Janice, um, your thoughts, please. Um, so again, that's the challenge at the beginning is what's the path? Because you're right. So what are the levers within it? I, I don't want to say it is or it isn't, but I, um, so how, if you're already a low cost state from Medicare, the question I would ask you is what's the lever to address the commercial aspect within the program? Is there a clear path? There could be that I, you know, don't have enough insight to respond to. So I, I don't want to mm -hmm. give you an answer, but that's where what is the lever that if we enter ahead, knowing we're already starting out ahead of, <laughs> sorry, the pun, but ahead from mm -hmm. a Medicare per <laughs> beneficiary spend, what's the lever that's going to produce the lower commercial rates and, and, and right. how how's the methodology going to effectuate that? And is there a clear path there? So to me, if there's not a clear path there, because that's what you're struggling with, then I would say the answer is no. If there is a path there that yes, we can use this lever to actually reduce, then the answer could be yes. Um, and also what's the data to show? And I don't know, I can't produce this for Pennsylvania. So I would challenge what's the data that actually shows a global budget reduces or or that the residents of Vermont or the residents of Maryland that through a global budget actually experienced reduced out of pocket spend because that's what I hear you stating is that the issue is you know it, it it's the cost that the Vermonters are having to pay whether that's the employees or the employers excuse me the employers through you know through through funded plans like, so what's the connection between a head that's going to actually yield the result of lower cost yeah. to the Vermonters? And so I, mm -hmm. I would challenge you to do that exercise. And if that's truly mm -hmm. what you're trying to achieve, make sure that you see that pathway versus reacting to a head and saying, well, this is it because it's the only thing we have. 
can you see that and can you achieve your objective within the framework that the ahead offers you? And, and I don't have enough knowledge sitting here today to say yes or no, that's the work that should be done. And then access, are we paying for what are the services that we want if we have to move towards regional strategies, which I think it might've been Bruce, um, you know, that that showed that like, so so what do we want in every rural community? And, and if that's what we want, we have to be willing to pay for it. Um, and then what needs to be moved for regional? Also taking into consideration mountainous terrain, winter months, all of the things that you, That's you know, me. having driven through your terrain enough to know, very similar to PA, there's more than just distance and mileage and all of that when we talk about key services. So that yes, would be me. how I would answer you. Yeah, thank you. It's, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it's a different analytic approach to um, consider what we need and then design for it versus seeing a model that has some legacy appeal and trying to make it to our needs. Um, and also, Bob? Yeah, and also, sorry, take, sorry, one more point, sorry. Also take into consideration, not the needs tomorrow, but like, you know, as you're looking out 10, 15 years based on most rural communities are aging, you know, what, what, what are the needs 10 years from now and how do we design a system within the new payment paradigm that will, that will support that system versus reacting to the reacting right now. I, I feel like there's a lot of us reacting. I understand. I understand. Yeah. And I appreciate you bringing up the aging um, portion because while it is true that Vermont is aging rapidly, right, is it not also true that the absolute number of people who are going to be over 65 is far less than it has been because boomers, sad to say they're dying. Generation X is a much smaller group. Millennials are then larger, but there's a big space in there where there are fewer people. And I see Bruce shaking his head. So Bruce, tell me how I'm wrong about that, please. You're, you're on mute. I'm sorry. I, I don't think you're wrong about the um, relative proportions, except that the actually the proportions of the advanced elderly over 75, those over 65, are roughly going to double. Yes, right? sir. And the, the, and the, yes. And the, right. And so, and they have pretty intense health care needs. Yes, so it places the greater demand. I, I you know, I, I agree with with the point that numerically the younger folks are still the majority. But when you think about health care costs, as I tried to point out, it's the top of that population pyramid where your costs are really occurring. And the yep. the the very appropriate population health based approaches to down at the lower levels to prevent that rise take a long time to pay off, right? Smoking cessation. Yes. So yes, sir. Yes. Um, and I'm I'm not great at math in public, and but I'm going to take a stab for a second. If we have 200 people in a in a region, and 50 percent of those people are over 65, we have 100 people over 65. If we have 100 people in a region because the population has declined and 70% are over 65. It's a higher percentage over 65, but now we have 70 elderly people compared to 100. Right, and and the, um, let's see, I'm trying to get to my volume numbers here. You're gonna have and, uh, in a population, let's say uh, Rutland, your total population estimated until through 2040 uh, drops from 61,000 to 52,000. But your population of elderly, uh, that is uh, 65 years old and up, uh, goes roughly from 13,000 or a little less than a quarter of the total to 19,000 out of 52 which is, um, you know, about 40%. So, 
say. So, so you are seeing because of the declining population, a large part of that coming from the under 65, you are seeing both an increase in the number and the proportion of people who are um, going to require more service. Thank you for that. Um, Bob, I, I see your hand up and my next question is actually for you. So maybe we, in a matter of time, I'll ask it and then we can try to tie it together. Um, I'm most familiar with you because of your writing on regulatory capture and policy failure. And so um, I was wondering if you would comment a little bit more um, on the complexity of market share adjustments and service line adjustments when it comes to setting global payments and how that how that relates to your understanding and what you've written about the risks of policy failure and regulatory capture. Sure, um, let me just quickly address the original issue about um, the problems you all face there, high prices from the private sector, uh, low utilization rate, lower uh, Medicare costs. Um, I think the high prices issue is, that's I started out my presentation, that's the primary goal for regulatory agencies to address that, particularly in the private sector. So the way to do that is through a mandatory system, and that mandatory system requires that all insurers licensed in the state uh, are part of the regulatory model that you set up. That's the model in Maryland. There's insurance statute that requires every payer to pay the rates that the HSCRC sets. So that's the number one rule right out of the, the box. Um, with regard to low utilization rates, um, it's great that you're in that position, um, but uh, the rate setting system can be structured to, to uh, recognize that. You know, you're starting out with historical budgets. Um, the, you know, there's still, I would argue, probably a lot of room uh, that hospitals can um, focus on to generate lower redu you know, reductions in unnecessary care. There's a huge volume of literature out there about low value care. And you can structure rate setting incentives to try to direct hospitals to reduce that unnecessary use. And that also improve their operational efficiency. Because I would argue that hospitals in the United States are grossly inefficient. When you look at what MedPAC produces, um, you compare um, hospital costs in the United States to, in, in, to hospital costs in other developed countries, we are stratospheric. So there's still room to, re, to improve hospital efficiency over time. Um, I think the HEAD program has a, a tremendous amount of flaws, one being it's not mandatory, two, it won't require all hospitals and all payers to participate, three, it's incredibly complex, a HEAD's not going to get you there. Um, so I, I would, I would again, respectfully re recommend that you all design your own model, apply separately to the CMS to get a waiver for Medicare and Medicaid, and then try to structure a rate setting system that deals with the issues and characteristics that are specific to Maryland. Um, lastly, with regard to capture and failure, um, I think the issue with regard to regulatory failure, um, I think uh, William very articulately um, addressed that, which is the tendency to do too many things because hospitals are complaining and it's a squeaky wheel uh, phenomenon. And then you get a situation where the rate setting system is far too complicated. Rate setters need to resist that tendency and focus in on setting, again, simpler systems, broad incentives and targets and goals, and make the system well understood and formula based. That's the way the system in Rochester worked. That's the way the early system in Maryland worked. So I think that's one way to address regulatory failure keep it simple and then try to resist the tendency to make arbitrary, politically popular adjustments over time. With regard to capture, I think there are structural features, and I wrote about this, that you can build into your agency, make it more of a public utility type of model. It's very public, um, have uh, restrictions, you know, have, have it be very much based on governance through the uh, Administrative Procedures Act in your state or nationally. Um, have it be very transparent, try to, to a certain extent, isolate the regulatory staff from the influence of the hospitals. I think we're all human, we're all uh, influenced by people that are in our face every day or every week, so you need to have some distance between the regulatory staff and the agency, but otherwise encourage open communication at that public level. That's, that's the way many successful public utilities operate and that's a good way of avoiding capture. Thank you, sir. Back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you, everyone.
Um, maybe we can go another 10 minutes. We do have an afternoon agenda. Um, and then if Dave or Robin have anything to jump in with. I, I just have one sort of additional topic that came up in my mind as we were talking about the number of critical access hospitals we have in Vermont and the, the, the conceptual idea that if we could design the system to deliver the care we wanted to deliver, this is brought up that maybe certain hospitals would do less of certain things. And I think one of the complexities that we have in Vermont right now is that the tertiary hospitals are packed and they can't take more. And what they really want is the smaller hospitals to take those those patients, but we don't we we don't have like a ring of mid-sized hospitals. We don't we, we have you know Dartmouth and UVM, which are relatively large for our area, but you know there are definitely community hospitals in the country that are bigger or as big or bigger than them. But you know, as, as somewhere in that mid-sized range that has services that can do that sort of moderate intensity level of care has you know ICU capabilities that has neurologists and cardiologists and a cath lab and surgeons and that can do the things that a lot of community hospitals do in Vermont you know we we have so if we were to think about rebalancing where services are are we need to make sure that services are somewhere and not just in the two academic centers that can't take any more and, and and anyways that's something I just just a reflection I don't know. I think Bruce was nodding his head, but then went off screen. But I, I don't know if he had some some thoughts on that. But um, not a question, just more of a comment. Well, uh, and and I would just offer. I think uh, so. You're right, um, and that's where when you talk about getting rid of beds, you know, and making sure that from a bed capacity, um, Vermont is right side. But then, how do you leverage technology? And is there a way to, you know, do some of this care where the, the rural community can still do it, but with telehealth connectivity, remote monitoring, some of this to, to, to allow the patient to go back to the community for either rehab or even some of like, how do you leverage the technology? Because even going back to the access question, we can only measure access to primary care and access if we have enough primary care providers, if we have enough mental health providers, if we have enough post-acute care beds. So part of this is ensuring that you have the infrastructure because the last thing you wanna do is hold people accountable for access measures that you don't have the infrastructure, um, but then how do you leverage technology in the 21st century to 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 make sure? And and my issue, even going back to the REH, is there's things that rural community hospitals are well, critical access hospitals are well equipped to do. And we've made it more about inpatient and outpatient, which quite frankly, in my mind, is a payment policy decision, not a clinical care. And how do you divide, develop the system that allows the rural hospitals to provide the care that they can do well and effectively and pay them to do that versus this inpatient versus outpatient? Um, and so, again, how do we leverage technology? Technology, the use of this has to be part of, you know, to, to stretch us uh, sparse resources across your state. Technology has to pay a, play a big role in that. I have one question, but Bob, I don't know if you're waiting to go to answer Dave's. Yeah, I was just going to make a couple of quick comments again. I apologize for all this info, but um, hospitals in those those uh, more urban centers are packed largely in part because they're under fee for service and the incentives are related to fee for service are to increase volumes because they generate marginal revenue and excess of marginal costs. And that's how they that's one of the ways they increase their profits. If you change the incentives and put those hospitals under a flexible type global budget type of process, you remove that incentive. So you'll see capacity open up. Uh, once you make the shift in terms of the payment arrangement incentives. And again, I argue a mandatory model, everybody's in. Those are the most effective structures. Then also I would emphasize this regional aspect of like the Rochester and the Finger Lakes model where they, they incorporated their priorities from a health planning and facilities uh, uh, capacity standpoint with the rate setting model itself to try to orient the services within the regions to meet the needs of the population there. Uh, Rochester and the Finger Lakes did that very, very well. They coordinated the planning function with the rate setting function so that you had some 
some some degree of integrity there. Um, again, I would highly recommend focusing in on what was uh, organized in Rochester and the Finger Lakes because I think there's direct applicability to Vermont. Great. So my question was around focusing transformation and transformation planning, um, both echoing some of the comments folks have made about ensuring that the pace makes sense for, for real change, as well as how to incorporate evidence basis into uh, that kind of transformation planning. One of the, the ideas that has been discussed in a Vermont Medicare global payment it, uh, methodology would be to have a Vermont specific transformation amount that could be incorporated into that hospital's global budget and connected to a transformation plan. So would love any thoughts um, you have around that topic. Now, let me uh, just maybe add to that question, which really is that a number of these activities are um, underway at various degrees of uh, speed and completion. For example, a, a statewide health information system. And we have uh, five hospitals in Vermont that are linked by the same electronic health record to either the university or Dartmouth. But all the others, the other eight, use different information systems. And talking about ways to advance population health and so forth and so on, that is not an issue which is really within the control of the hospital. So, you know, not it's not only focusing attention on the hospitals, but also on assisting some other parts of the healthcare system to get where they need to go. So, how have Maryland and Pennsylvania been been addressing that? So I can go first. Um, so certainly within our, our plan, one of the things that we've utilized is the community health needs assessment. And so, you know, trying to get um, the needs and, and, and again, each one of those are, are done with, with different levels of rigor. But really, as we think about transformation, I would say data informed. And so using a community level data, and it doesn't have to be just um, you know, hospital data or claims-based data. There's other folks out there as we think about like social determinants of health, you know, there's area deprivation indexes, there's other indexes or indices out there that could be used to help identify, but really would encourage you that your transformation planning should be done at the community level. And so I think my question back would be, you know, um, if you're gonna put forth money um, to, to help, I, I think that's a great idea. You, you've got to give them the investment, but there also has to be some justification for where they're starting and using data to inform at the community level to make sure that they're addressing um, the, the, the most urgent needs. So certainly we started this journey using claims-based data to, you know, we were focusing potentially avoidable utilization. So understanding the claim or the, the clinical conditions of why folks were presenting to the hospitals to start that, what were the clinical conditions that we were looking to impl Im impact through care management strategies. Um, but again, there's other, there's other indices outside of just hospital to, to your question, you know, Bruce there, that, that should be used to help inform transformation strategies and identify the needs where investment might be needed. Um, and again, at the community level, like I don't think there can be one blanket approach, but flexibility, just like we're talking about yeah. flexibility in the budgets at the hospital level, there has to be flexibility for, for transformation. But yet it should align, in my mind, what are the overall goals of Vermont? What are the overall goals of the Green Mountain Care Board? There should be a map you know, of, of the, the different things that each of the individual um, hospital communities are, are undertaking should map up to overarching Vermont goals as well. Great, thank you. I mean, we are we are taking the community health needs assessments and a number of the other state reports that deal with specific issues um, into consideration uh, for the recommendations, but was very interested in how, as you've said, in how you incorporate that in a new payment model. So thank you. Okay, um, Member Lunch, do you have any other questions? 
Um, seeing the oh. time, um, oh, go ahead, Carrie. Sorry, I was just gonna add one thing about workforce. I think that if you were going to use some of the, um, what did you call them, infrastructure payments or something, transformation payments, um, at the provider level, one place that might be most helpful is in workforce development. So thinking about what needs to be put together in order to increase workforce across the board, not just physicians in Vermont, and how some of those payments might be used to attract people um, to providing care here. Sorry, thanks. No, really important point for us here. Um, so I'm gonna take a quick public comment just because I do wanna hear feedback on this and then we'll switch to the next topic. Um, we don't have too much time, but we'll try and do it quickly. Um, Dale Hackett. Hey, Dale, nice to see you back here. How are you doing? Okay. Um, very good presentation. I really enjoyed listening to this. Uh, can I direct a question to a particular panel member? Sure. Okay, Janice. You mentioned Pennsylvania a lot, and I've actually been to Pennsylvania. My granddaughter went to college down there. So I've got an idea of their mountains and how rural they can be. Do you have any idea as far as what they did in the rural community? Was it a mobile service that came in? I mean, you've got populations of only 2,000 people in some of your places and if you've been up here to Vermont like you've got to Manchester Vermont no matter which way you go you've got to go through the mountains so winter weather is like okay I can't put a hospital anywhere else and really call that reliable health care if I gotta get the people out I need something in the town so in and you said you came from a manufacturing background as well. That distribution is really important. But are we talking just buildings or are we talking? Mm -hmm. I mean, Canada uses helicopters at one point because you got 9% of the population within 150, 200 miles of the border. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so thank you for the question because, um, you know, Talking about the infrastructure is really important. And to your question, we haven't gotten to mobile solutions yet as part of our current program, but thinking a part as part of a next generation. So again, we're 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 putting pen to paper of what comes next is we know mobile solutions have to be there because there are more cost effective ways um, to provide service. We think you know mobile integrated health, mobile services definitely can be part of it. We've got some regulatory hurdles to get over in the state of Pennsylvania. But again, would would challenge this, you know, what what's needed in terms of payment policy reform, you know, EMS um, you know, not only do we have a workforce shortage, but, you know, limitations of what currently EMS can be doing, you know, mobile integrated health strategies of how do you use some of these clinical personnel in the rural community to maybe, you know, do more than just transport people to a hospital. How do you use alternative types of care providers to take the care to the rural community? Um, so, no, it's not just hospitals, um, but I think that as we think about the future and the technology that we have um, you know, I, I have an animated slide that I also like to use to kind of cast a vision for mobile integrated health. And how do you use these types of strategies within alternative payment? Again, because the hospital within an, an alternative payment is incentivized different. And so, you know, bringing that patient to the hospital um, is not necessarily what's needed anymore, but can you train the EMS to give the aspirin of the Medicaid pay, you know, patient that calls the EMS because that's the only transportation they have? So how do we rethink and move forward um, using what technology we have to think of care outside the walls of the hospital, even hospital at home concepts? What types of care, infusions, all of that can be done safely in the home if we had the workforce, as has already been talked about here, if we had the workforce, how do you truly reinvent the rural health delivery system? And again, we, we are trying to piecemeal everything onto a very broken fee-for-service system. And we truly need to try to divorce, like rethink. And if we have the opportunity through some of these new payment models to truly rethink the future, what do we want to build? Knowing it's going to take time, 
none of this is going to be done tomorrow, but what's the system that we want to use? Again, getting to your point, the delivery system, the infrastructure, all of that, the pipeline, there's other ways to do things, but we have to think differently and we always compare to what we have. And that's that's the new mindset. One of my colleagues said earlier on this call, it requires a new mindset and it absolutely does. Thank you. So that was helpful, Dale. I think that was you, Dale. All right, Ham, you went over this morning, so let's see how we do this afternoon. You ready? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really good this afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very, <laughs> let me start out this way. I've watched these since 1987, okay? And today, this uh, is I, I, the metaphor I'm going to use for what you've done today is to say that we've spent the last 30 years sort of what if we were baseball guys would be watching the pony league in northern idaho and all of a sudden oh my god here we are and we're in yankee stadium so <laughs> we've got national class players and i think we have you to thank for that having said that um i've got two i've got i like to make two basic problem uh comments one is that i think that is that one of the things that worries me about listening to the guys in this in the in Yankee Stadium is that is that they keep talking about the hospitals and I believe that Vermont is not the hospitals the Vermont is two dramatically different hospital systems three of the hospitals have got 60 percent of the care and of that that's mostly UVM and 11 have 40 percent so the question so I I just think that you the the you you just really have got to start uh, breaking the thing into two into two hunks because there's no resemblance between uh, any of the eight critical access hospitals and a 500 bed uh, met, uh, academic medical center. The, and just so I'm going, just three comments. These are not questions because there are time to really I, I eat it up all all the time. Uh, here's what I would suggest. Um, we have doc. We've, we've got um, we've got Dr. Murray here from Maryland. Okay, let me just suggest something about. I I know a lot about Maryland. I live there. Okay, I've been in hospitals in places like Annapolis and Silver Spring. Okay, here's what here's what I suggest, and he could. But here's what I would ask him if I was talking to him. You can do all kinds of things in Maryland, okay, with hospitals. But let me suggest something I would bet real money you can't do. If you want to do something in the regulatory structure in Maryland that the doctors in Johns Hopkins think is really terrible, you are dead meat. That's just a suggested thought, okay? If you were, it's the kind of question I would ask Dr. Hamry um, um, about, 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 uh, his work in with Geisinger, and I don't. Re, I've I've read his his work in your in your um, in your uh, uh, archives ten times. It's very impressive. Okay, and but here's what I would ask him. He, and I don't have the. I can't remember the numbers exactly. But if you look at Geisinger, it's at least some multiple, maybe as much as five or even more the size of the whole state of Vermont. Guys, this is the Geisinger service area. Just, just, is, is it five or nine? Can I just ask him now? How big, how much bigger is Geisinger? Number. Okay, never mind. Well, um, the population, a population about three times, service area about the same. How about, what's the, what is the, that my, what my point is, what is the, what is the geographic uh, acreage or, my square mileage of the service area. So I think it's well, we the the reason roughly 27,000. Yeah, yeah, roughly so 27,000. I'm almost let me just interrupt. We're getting hey, hey, I'm sorry, we're 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 way over. So if there's you can just send some questions and we can try and get back, but I gotta get That's to Chule and the so others. The, the other thing, and this is for you, Mr. Chairman. You in the uh, in hearing we did the other day, you waved off the question of whether some uh, use it when volume were, were, were age adjusted. My here's a, just a gratuitous suggestion: talk to Ms. Cola, okay, and to probably Hamry, okay, and they will tell you that if you don't, if your data is not age adjusted, it's not worth having. I'm done. All right, I, 
And just for the record, I think you started over on your count of number of comments. I'm just noting. All right, Eric Schulteis. I promise I will try to keep this brief, Chair Foster. Um, so I think one of the things I heard that was missing from the stakeholders of this new process of system transformation is the voice of Vermonters. Um, you know, I think if we just look to quasi recent history, some of the political disillusionment and maybe fact twisting to some extent on all party sides about what's happened in the last six years has been due to a lack of engagement and understanding and hearing Vermonters voices. I think we can also look to say what happened in urban renewal, what happens when we have a purely top down technocratic driven solution, right? It doesn't work. Someone gets hurt. I think fundamentally we need to develop a shared truth amongst the various actors. So just thinking about community benefit or free care, um, you know, Vermont hospitals bulk compared to peers, and I'm confident in saying this, this is a preliminary analysis of five years of nine national 990 data. Um, Vermont hospitals book more unreimbursed Medicaid than their peers. That's despite Vermont having one of the best Medicaid reimbursement rates in the country, and despite the fact that Vermont payer mix is better. And until we address some of these shared beliefs and what actually is a benefit to the community, I don't think we can start moving forward because the different stakeholders have different views. And lastly, just about access, I think, Spatial access and spatial optimization is one dimension of access, but there are other components. So traveling 15 minutes for me for a doctor's appointment, no problem. I tell my boss I'm using sick time, I click out, but you know, the person who's working three jobs doesn't have sick time, can't do that. So I'm just thinking back to you, Dr. Hamry, the for some reason, the example of a hospital CEO saying all Vermonters have snow plows, that stuck with me, right? So what is the effect of organizational beliefs like that on patients? And sure, it's easier to measure who's used a surface, right? Realize access, but how do we measure and understand why people who could use a surface, why don't they use a surface? And even the question with utilization, sure, one, you want to have checks. You don't want to see utilization dropping precipitously. But there's a question of who is utilizing the surface? Is it the people we care about or is it just the wealthy people above, say, 800 FPL? That should concern us. And I think we have to have complex understandings of what access is and shared truths about how the system functions and should functions before we talk about payment reform, because payment reform alone without these shared truths is never going to solve the problem. Thank you. And um, my favorite voice of Vermonter is Walter Carpenter. Hi, Owen. Thanks for the kudos. Hey. Favorite voice. I do, if I had a wish, I could coin a Walter medal to all five members of the Green Mountain Care Board for having to sit through meetings like this, discussing models. They've been through about 10,000 of these meetings on 10,000 different models. And I just have a couple comments, really, no real questions. As I listen to all the experts and everything and all the talk about hospitals, this and that, one of the things I want to say is, where is the patient in that? And I think one of the biggest and most horrible things we do in this healthcare, in our healthcare non-system, which it really is, is that we treat the patient as a consumer. And in all of these presentations, it sounds like I'm sitting in a Harvard Business School class or a school at Babson where my father was a teacher, or a professor rather. 
listening to how to run market share and all that. Healthcare is not about that. I was a patient. I know what it's like to go through a system where profit is the motive and where operating revenue or margins and all that. I just had a friend who broke her hip, kicked out of the hospital after a, you know, a one day stay, not even a day after they fixed her up, they just threw her out. Um, <clears throat> I had to go get her. A healthcare system is about patient. It, it, you know, when I hear talks about utilization, it kind of fires me up because that's what the damn system's for, is to be utilized. So I'll be quiet there because I know Owen wants to get on, get going. Thank you, Walter. Thanks for thanks for coming as always. Um, one oh, last had, one. I had to work the last two days, the last two weeks. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, to... come come by and try and say hi sometime. Um, uh, last one, we have a hand up from guest. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, uh, Robert Hoffman calling in. Um. I'll frame this up. I'll do my best to be brief. Uh, I know I haven't been in the past, but um, I'll frame it up by recalling a session with Dr. Kala back in 2019. Uh, she threw up the problem, the public health crisis of uh, gun violence, gun mortality, and um, <clears throat> was leading a class on that. And uh, we're talking about an intervention. So the problem was gun mortality and, and how do we solve it? We threw up all the uh, solutions that have been tried and available, and each of us broke out in MBA form to try and solve it. And the class all returned to the known variables of how to solve gun violence. And um, just like the last seven years, we have data to show what the, the contributions of capitation have been to the state of Vermont. Uh, similarly, when it came to gun violence, uh, there wasn't really that much progress made. And uh, uh, what I proposed at that time was stratified by mortality. Most of the mortality is related to uh, under 23 years of age, black and Latino males uh, committing uh, firearm uh, violence. And uh, the other major population is stratified by is middle-aged white males committing suicide. And then can we look at tax credits to solve for uh, how do we get guns? How do we incentivize guns being taken out of those communities? It was an out of box idea, um, but at the time, Dr. Collis said it was a good one. I wanna encourage you all to similarly think about your problem ahead of you. Um, your problem is not containing costs. You've done a good job of that, and uh, Medicare has told you that. Um, ahead, we'll continue to solve for that problem. Uh, Walter asked a moment ago, who, where's the patient in all this? For years, I've sent you all, and I believe I even sent it to Dr. Kala at one time asking if she was interested in it. Um, Vermont has had materially significant declines uh, in health outcomes since capitation was introduced, concurrent to hospital insolvency and declining access. And moreover, based on the, the data that I've pulled across the measures for which this state is supposed to be measured. Um, there's been, uh, as a result of capitation, and not no specific actor here, but just uh, the, state of, the state applying itself to a CMMI experiment involving capitation, there's been an excess of mortality in 18 to 65 year olds across, across measures that um, the state's supposed to be monitoring. So what I would encourage you all to do is to the question of, do we miss out if we don't participate in the head because we're gonna miss out on some X millions of dollars in transformation funds. Um, that's poverty of imagination. You have a lot of uh, options available to you and you have a lot of smart people on this call and a lot of smart people on your team. Um, I'd strongly encourage you all to utilize the collective imagination you have to come up with solutions um, and quickly. 
And I guess I'll just put one last plug in. By 2030, we could already be seeing the entire transformation uh, landscape changed. Uh, if you're unaware, uh, Medicare just adopted policies to start reimbursing for uh, weight loss medications that are already causing dialysis makers to uh, have their stocks bottom out. Um, transformation's happening all around us, and there's going to be people that are going to be beating us to it. And some projections predict that very meaningful percentage of the population that's driving these costs that you're trying to solve for are not even going to be there for you to solve for in a decade. So one of your commenters mentioned, what are you, what are you building towards in 10 years? You have a really, really um, ambitious plan to try and do things here, but you, you got to also calibrate it to where's it going to land you in 10 years? Um, and you're locking yourself into <clears throat> potentially a model that's going to last 10 years. And it's going to leave um, legacy level institutions. Uh, and to member Walsh's point, possible of creating regulatory capture, of creating massive um, second order effects that, as with all payer, you weren't able to anticipate. Um, much more profound likely with the complexity of this model, which is uh, makes the APM look comparatively simple. So I just want to bring it back to Walter. You know, these decisions are life and death ones, and uh, we all get to go home after a meeting like today and feel excited about all the uh, discussion and use of policy lingo that we love using. And the reality is these decisions are going to have lasting effects on people's lives, many of them just like Walter. And so I strongly uh, enjoin you all to hear his voice and the many others who uh, haven't really volunteered to entrust your lives to them, but uh, by virtue of them being your constituents as part of this administration, uh, you're making life and death decisions for them. Thank you. Thank you for chiming in and with your thoughts, Mr. Hoffman. Um, I'd like to end it there and take a five minute break before we go to our next one. I apologize to Elena and Shule for being a little over, but I thought this was really productive and important. And uh, I want to really thank Elena for putting this together and for Carrie, William, Bob, Bruce and Janice for being so generous with your time. I know all of us board members had this date circle circled on our calendar for good reason, and it didn't disappoint. We wanted all these diverse views to kind of help us think about these problems, and, and you really helped us do that. So I hadn't met all of you, but it was nice to in this setting, and thanks for your generosity in helping Vermont with us. Um, we'll take a five minute break and come back for the next presentation. Thank you, everyone. Hey, Shule, how you doing? Good, how are you? Well, sorry, we are massively over. No problem, no problem at all. Um, I can stay as long as you need me, but I wanted to ask how much time would you like to allocate given where we are? Um, let me, um, if I send you an email while we go, can you read it? Sure. I just wanna check with folks, I'll send you a real message. Okay. Okay, so we'll resume our hearing and turn it over to uh, Elena and Ms. Garovich for the AHEAD presentation. Great, and we will breeze through these. Um, so, and Michelle, thank you for running the slides. I'll just very briefly talk about the schedule, where we are in the schedule and then pass it over so we can get moving. So we'll walk through the methods paper, the draft one, um, today, Shule Garovich will walk us through that. Um, and then we were going to post the methodology, the draft paper itself. We hoped yesterday, but we're still tweaking a little bit. So our hope is to post it tomorrow. We'll still extend the public comment period accordingly um, and then continue discussion um, and come back to kind of how we want to think about the board vote at the end of this conversation. So hopefully you've had time to think about what we introduced to you um, last time we talked about the Medicare hospital global budget specification um, and methodology. So I will turn it over to Shule. Thank you. 
All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And I, I caught the end of the prior discussion. It's been great discussion so far. Um, so we are going to go back to the uh, details around the financial methodology. Um, so we wanted to start with the kind of requirements that the CMS has under the AHEAD model. Given the time, um, maybe I won't go through all of them, but highlight the ones that are kind of important to keep in mind. So if you advance to the next slide, that will be great. Um, you know, in general, this is starting with the hospital, right? So the minimum requirement is to have hospital inpatient outpatient services, uh, but they do recognize that the critical access hospitals would have uh, additional adjustments under this model. Uh, TCOC, um, so total cost of care adjustment, is a requirement as part of this uh, CMS uh, notification. Next slide, please. Um, the other requirements, um, you know, the social risk is a big one that is new uh, that hasn't been done in Maryland or Pennsylvania, um, and that the um, there's also considerations for early recruitment of the hospitals um, and create incentives so hospitals join early could benefit from the program uh, more. Next slide, please. Uh, quality is a component. Um, so, as you know, hospital payments in the Medicare program are already adjusted for quality. Um, the requirement is that the state designated methodology should also have uh, hospital level quality performance uh, in the methodology. Next slide, please. Uh, we already mentioned the accountability for total cost of care. Um, the number eight is, I think, very important to remember. Um, reflecting on some of the conversations around fixed versus flexible budget, um, this, the CMS is requiring the state methodology to adjust the budget based on service line changes um, and shifts between providers. Um, so the idea here that to balance the incentives around uh, doing more utilization to um, increase the volume and revenue under fee for service uh, versus uh, the unintended consequences of the fixed payment where uh, hospitals may uh, reduce access or shut down their services. Um, and the um, the number 10 is kind of thinking through the critical access hospitals or safety net hospitals um, that they are requiring uh, the critical access hospitals to move away from cost based reimbursement, um, but they are allowing the methodology to do additional adjustment to reflect the cost. All right, am I, am I going too fast? Should I slow down a little bit? OK, good. Um, so as Alina mentioned, um, the current methodology methods paper, we call it, is a version one. Uh, there are still um, some details that need to be worked out, um, but we also are expecting public feedback, additional board feedback, as well as the CMS feedback to call this as a final version. But keep in mind that these methodologies kind of change over time. So I expect that over time uh, there will be additional considerations and we try to summarize that in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. Um, so we'll just run down each adjustment or each decision um, and give you a comparison of what is in the ahead uh, if we made changes for the Vermont specific uh, methods and future considerations and, and rationale. So um we you know as as we go through it um i will try to i'll do my best to explain the rationale so the first one is eligible facilities um so ahead requires at minimum acute care hospitals um, we did not make any changes in the methodology to that eligibility criteria. Uh, there have been discussions about expanding it to specialty hospitals so that could be a potentially a future consideration for the vermont model the second one is about included and excluded services in the AHEAD model. Um, it includes only hospital part A inpatient and outpatient hospital outpatient departments. Um, so, um, and then there are a series of exclusions that we had discussed extensively in prior meetings. Um, so we are um, kind of ex you know, using the exclusion criteria from the ahead, um, and there needs to be additional conversation with CMS around how to handle the blueprint, SASH, and CHD payments that the CMS currently uh, provides to Vermont. In terms of future considerations, uh, professional services um, was 
designated as a high priority during our stakeholder engagement process last year. Um, so that will be the priority to work um, to include in the global payment methodology. So this includes professionals who are employed uh, by the hospitals or have uh, delegated their billing authority to hospitals. Um, and also the other services that are owned by hospitals, such as clinics, rural health uh, clinics, or uh, skilled nursing facilities uh, could potentially be added to this model in, in future years. And the reason why we accepted the exclusions is to concern around the access. So these are high cost patients or high intensive um, high cost drugs type of services. So excluding them is going to kind of protect the access or reduce the concerns around unintended consequences. The reason why we couldn't include physician was mainly due to data issues and methodology that we did. We needed more time uh, to verify and, and figure out how to collect that data on the uh, on the Medicare side. And the um, the last one is as the baseline calculations as um, as it was brought up. Uh, we are using historical payment amounts to calculate the baseline revenues. Um, so we will be using three year weighted average similar to the AHEAD model, uh, but we are making a modification that if the last year of the baseline is higher than the average, we will take that higher amount. Uh, and the reason for that is to avoid uh, that drop in the revenue in the first year of the program if they already are at a higher level in the last year in the baseline. All right, um, so I will go to the next ones. Um, there is a language to allow exception based factors, so these could be ad hoc. Um, so we are taking that concept as well from the CMS methodology, uh, but in the Vermont uh, specifications, we added additional considerations such as the impact on um, overall state target, uh, commercial uh, payment rates, um, and these will be um, approved by the CMS, but it's also require uh, CMS approval uh, per uh, the CMS regulations. Um, so currently there is no future consideration, but it may evolve over time as we get more experience in what those exception based factors might be. And the reason why we have this, as, as you all know, we cannot predict everything. The pandemic happened in the midst of the uh, Pennsylvania rural health model that they need to work through additional adjustments, for example. Um, so having a language and understanding that there might be um, situations where additional adjustments will be made um, is important to have in, in the methodology. Sequestration is a um, is kind of a, a general 2% adjustment downward done in all provider payments in Medicare. Um, it's a statutorily required adjustment, so we do not have flexibility, so we will be applying the head methodology in the in the state model. Next slide, please. Moving on to the baseline incentives, um, the first one is the transformation incentive. Um, this is in the CMS methodology as 1% for the first two years. Uh, we chose to take that um, adjustment as it is, uh, but in the future, uh, we may need to consider additional incentives uh, for the transformation. Um, what we have different from the AHEAD is the Vermont Health Delivery Reform Investment, uh, where uh, the Vermont methodology is uh, creating a, a pool of funding uh, that will be available to hospitals uh, for a number of years uh, to support healthcare de delivery reform in the state. Um, and rationale for having this is, as has been discussed, Vermont has a, a low cost Medicare state, uh, low utilization rates, um, and access issues uh, that this additional funding is needed to support investments, not only on the hospital field, uh, but, but in the non-hospital provider space as well. Um, we created the pool as opposed to adjusting global budgets, similar to the transformation incentive, uh, because we uh, recognize that the, um, the Act 167 and other, like it's going to be very local, so it requires additional 
uh, review process or application process uh, to balance available pool with the needs that the community uh, would would um, uh, put forward to do this this investment program. And I say by we, um, so I just I think I did that in the last one. We appreciate the stakeholder feedback, the staff. Um, so I'm using Royal V here uh, that this is truly a collaborative effort uh, with the staff, board members involved, your feedback as well as the stakeholder. So I just wanted to make that clear as well. Next slide, please. All right, so we have set of other adjustments. So as we created the baselines and incentives, annual updates, inflation update, um, CMS is using uh, market basket uh, minus the uh, productivity adjustment. In Vermont version, uh, we are only using market basket adjustment, and the intention is that we would do an efficiency effectiveness adjustment on an all-payer basis uh, that will be designed and implemented at a later stage. Um, the demographic changes, so these are the beneficiary changes happening in the traditional Medicare. In the AHEAD model, um, the adjustments are done on age, HCC, which is the risk score that CMS uses, and the population growth, and then they do a correction at the, at the end of the period to adjust it using the observed beneficiary trends. Um, instead of using population growth, uh, Vermont methodology is going to use the actual beneficiary change, and the adjustments will be based on age, sex, and ESRD. Um, the future consideration here is HCC adjustment, so this is the risk adjustment. Um, we chose not to have the HCC adjustment initially for multiple reasons. So um, the first one is demographic adjustment is already capturing a large variation in hospital cost. HCC adjustments are actually on the total cost, not just hospital. So there is that mismatch of methodology if you are trying to predict the hospital cost. Um, second, um, CMS is currently transitioning the way that the risk adjustment scores are calculated, so methodology change. Um, and in the next three years, um, the change in HCC scores may reflect the methodology itself not the risk profile of the Vermont residents. So we didn't want to have that additional uncertainty in that initial years, uh, but we would be monitoring and potentially including FCC adjustment in future years. And in addition to um, HCC adjustment, um, I will go to the social risk adjustment. So this is additional 2%, up to 2% funding for providers who are serving uh, the um, underserved areas. Um, and in the CMS methodology, um, uh, they create an index using area deprivation index, a proportion of Medicare, Medicaid dual eligible, or uh, those who are you know, eligible for Part D low income status uh, to create a hospital social risk factor. Um, for Vermont, uh, the methodology will use um, social vulnerability index, um, and it will also use the dual eligible, uh, which is the Medicaid as well. Um, we we modeled some of the SDI and ADI and provided additional information in the past. I'm happy to go into the detail if there are any questions. Uh, but basically, SVI is chosen based on the feedback from the stakeholders, um, and mainly ADI seem to be looking at a very small geographies and giving the population in Vermont, um, the rates seem to be fluctuating and not, um, not as accurate as the SVI. Um, and one additional change that Vermont methodology is going to have is this score will be calculated every three to five years. CMS methodology is updating it every year. Uh, based on our initial modeling, we didn't see much change year over year. Um, so this also reduces the you know, uncertainty. So hospitals who score the highest will get that funding for the first three years will recalculate the scores. If there are major changes, then their payment will be adjusted accordingly. Medicare policy updates. Um, so these are additional payments the Medicare uh, pays for medical education, uncompensated care. Um, we, the Vermont methodology is applying the AHEAD, so no changes there. And the reason why uh, there are no additional adjustment is to maintain 
um, the um, benefit of these adjustments for Vermont hospitals um, so that they are not losing any of these additional adjustments or policy changes in the future by participating in the global uh, payment program. Next slide, please. Um, the final set of uh, adjustments are on quality and performance. Uh, as I mentioned, CMS requires the quality adjustments and they are using their current uh, various hospital quality programs. Um, in the Vermont methodology, we are working towards creating a simpler approach to account for these adjustments, uh, but mainly taking those scores initially. And the future consideration for Vermont is to develop an all payer hospital quality program and replace all the CMS adjustments under global payment. The the critical access hospitals are required to report and then will be um, receiving additional payment based on their performance in future years in the CMS methodology. Uh, Vermont uh, methods are adapting that concept, uh, but we would like to assess the feasibility of these additional measures because given the small number of um, utilization and cost, some of these measures may not be valid or not usable. Um, so um, there needs to be additional assessment there, whether it's even worth doing some of those measures if you know that there's only 10 inpatient visits, for example. Health equity improvement bonus. Um, this is a new program under AHEAD. Um, CMS is uh, providing up to half a percent additional bonus if the hospital reduces disparities uh, for um, quality. Um, Vermont method applies the same concepts uh, and to align with our other measurement approach, um, we will be using the SVI, the Social Vulnerability Index. Um, and then again, in future years, we do want to look at the small cell, cell size issues and, and consider potentially measuring this over multiple years rather than doing it on an annual adjustment. Uh, total cost of care performance adjustment is a requirement in the AHEAD. Um, and here, um, the differences in Vermont is going to be substantial uh, compared to the CMS methodology, given the geography and the hospital service areas. Um, but we will be assigning geographic attribution, so not an individual similar to CMS, uh, but we will be applying um, adjustment factors to account for market share of each hospital. If you remember um, one of the slides I presented earlier, um, some of our hospitals in Vermont have only 30% of total spend in their HSA. So um, we would like to account for those uh, and prorate some of these TCOC adjustments. Exclusions are additional specific considerations for methods. Um, it wasn't clear to us in the ahead whether um, the additional payments for transformation or the additional primary care payments or if the blueprint payments will be included in the TCOC. Um, so that will be additional changes in the in the Vermont methods to ensure uh, that we um, we do not um, penalize hospitals if they are getting social risk adjustment, for example, that they would have to pay back uh, through the total cost measures. Um, we, for the future consideration, um, currently it's a 2% maximum, um, and that may change in the future uh, once the modeling is done and experience is gained in the total cost of uh, care measurement. The last one is the effectiveness efficiency adjustment. So um, this was um, in the CMS methodology based on the reductions in potentially avoidable utilization. Um, the adjustments are listed here. Um, we are going to be, um, we haven't put any current effectiveness or efficiency adjustment. Uh, what we have put in the methods is to develop an effectiveness on an all payer basis. And this would focus on effect, not only effectiveness, but efficiency and productivity as well. Um, and the reason why the CMS has this is to increase incentives to focus on avoidable utilization. Um, and given the data uh, analyses that we did and the low rates of uh, utilization in Vermont, um, the Vermont methodology do not have that specific adjustment. Next slide, please. 
The service line changes um, is an important topic to make sure the global budgets are adjusted for um, changes in services that are desired um, and create additional incentives to align with the transformation plans. Um, in the service line adjustments, the, the big one is the prospective adjustment. So that's the first adjustment. Um, if a hospital is opening a new service or closing down a service, um, the idea is that the global budget will be adjusted prospectively. There will be a process for approval and that in the Vermont methodology, uh, the, um, the methodology is calling for a standardized list of service lines that will go to an expedited review process. Um, and the um, reductions in the um, closed down or reduced services will be done at 50%, which is aligning with the head model. The new uh, service lines are reconciled to two year uh, fee for service. So there is no risk for opening new service lines compared to fee for service. So if the projections are lower than experienced, um, so the hospitals will receive their fee for service in the first two years of the, that, that expansion. Um, the reason why we have the service line adjustments, as I mentioned, is to ensure access, improve sustainability of the hospitals, and to cover some of that fixed cost, uh, but also support the transformation um, that um, the healthcare uh, in Vermont needs, and then Act 167 has been uh, instrumental in, in kind of designing the next phase of those uh, needed services in the communities. We also created the standardized list to reduce administrative burden, um, but there might be additional ideas that we could implement to, uh, to reduce the administrative burden while aligning these services with the population health goals and health equity goals that the state is going to work on. The next set of adjustments are market shift adjustments. So these are the adjustments to track changes between um, hospitals, right? If a patient is going from one hospital to the other, how do we adjust the global budget? Um, there is an algorithm that the AHEAD is using. It's similar to... Um, can you hear me okay? I got a poor network quality. Okay. Um, the head is using an algorithm and it was developed in Maryland, adapted in Pennsylvania. Um, and actually nobody likes this algorithm. It's complicated. Um, hospitals do not like it. Um, they do want it, but they don't like it. So just to, to be clear um, that this is a complicated methodology. Um, in Vermont, uh, the issues using that algorithm is that the um, cell sizes are small, tracking these movements between hospitals will be complicated on an annual basis. Um, so rather than doing an automatic one, you know, run the algorithm, calculate these and apply it, uh, the methodology calls for uh, detailed market shift reviews every three years um, and then assess if the rebasing is needed. So this would counteract the um, unintended consequence of closing services. I mean, if they close, you're going to know, but if they are reducing and the service line adjustment is not picking up every three years, uh, there will be a review at the service line level to understand if the if the patients are using different hospitals than the participating hospital in the program. The last one is the unplanned volume shift. Um, so we have prospective adjustments. We are going to review every three years service line trends. And the last one is like an overall assessment of what is happening to utilization or volumes. Um, in the AHEAD model, there is an automatic adjustment if the variance is greater than 5%. Um, in the Vermont methodology, um, it will trigger a review and understanding of what is happening and then potentially make an adjustment after that 5%. So we um, institute a review process because given the challenges in the data and the trends and small numbers, um, these 5% change, more than 5% changes may be warranted um, and they may not trigger additional uh, payment adjustment in the global budget. Next slide, please. 
Um, the critical access hospitals, um, the AHEAD model has a reimbursement floor for critical access hospitals. In Vermont methodology, we are applying a similar concept, uh, but that that floor will be updated every year as opposed to fixed in the last baseline. And then we are including uh, medically Medicare dependent hospitals, MDHs, as part of this adjustment. Um, CMS just does this for critical access hospitals. Um, the rationale for including the MDHs, their payments are really tied to Medicare as well, and there could be unintended consequences for not including MDHs cost reports um, in, in this type of adjustment. Finally, um, our um, concern around commercial reliance is um, uh, CMS methodology do not mention this since it's very CMS Medicare oriented, but given the Vermont conversations and the board's hospital budget review process, um, and there will be additional adjustment to incorporate the commercial reliance in the future work. Um, so that could go into an efficiency measure as one aspect of efficiency, uh, but also as we look at the commercial global payment methods, that there could be additional considerations uh, for the commercial rates uh, compared to Medicare and, and potentially have other venues to adjust the global payment for commercial payers to reflect that um, uh, commercial um, impact of um, global budgets. And I think that gets me to. Yes, thank you. All right. Thank you, Shule. Um, great. So we have only a couple minutes left, so I will breeze through. This is there. It's the same calendar we've presented before about kind of all the other components. So this is just one piece. And as you noted, this is a, a draft. It's a version one. We expect this to continue to evolve. And there's some kind of underlying components that need more modeling and fleshing out and thinking about processes for reviewing, for example, the service line changes, et cetera. Um, so we can go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, so we had proposed or we had been um, kind of moving under the assumption at one point that the board, that you all would be voting on a methodology um, and that, you know, then we would create a specification that we would submit that is consistent with that methodology, um, you know, but I think if we keep going to the next slide, last time we spoke, um, we kind of recognize some of the challenges that had been surfaced around um, kind of all the other components kind of there's still, you know, there's still work to do to flesh out kind of the more granular processes and um, some of the adjustments in the um, payment design. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of um, intricacies as it relates to the broader model. And as we've been talking about how will transformation work? Um, what is the total cost of care? How is that going to work and how will it, what can we negotiate and what will, how will that intersect with our payment design? Um, so there's still a lot of things to kind of work out. And um, so we thought maybe a possible solution to at least continuing this conversation so you don't have to kind of um, approve a half-baked <laughs> product is to delegate to staff, um, but establish some principles for what you hope to, can be accomplished with such a payment design. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we proposed some language and some principles last week. I don't know if you've had time to think about these or if you have specific comments back for staff, um, given that we have 15 minutes. I, we can go quickly and then I imagine we'll have to pick this up at a later board meeting, um, but would love to hear your thoughts on the general approach. I believe there's another slide with kind of some guiding questions um, that we could stop and kind of get preliminary feedback. Um, at least, you know, do you want to vote on a final product or how do you feel about delegating to staff to complete and submit um, a specification consistent with a set of principles um, that you would outline? Um, as shared on the previous slide. Okay, thank you, Elena and, and Shule. Um, got like 10 minutes or so, so if board members have any thoughts or questions they want to share now. I'll just quickly jump in and say, generally speaking, I. I think it's reasonable for us to, I'm supportive of the idea that we would delegate the specific model details to the staff for now pre-negotiation with the idea that the board still has a chance to vote on the model post-negotiation 
which I think is implicit in this discussion. I don't know if you specifically said that today, but have in the past. So I, I feel I feel that that um, it, it's I agree. I think it's really hard to vote on the model when we don't know where it's going to end up in negotiation. And so to me, I'd rather vote on it after the negotiation point. I would agree with Dave, just in the sense that also there's so many variables that will be subject to negotiation that are all interacting. And so having the ability to review it as a whole with all of the work that we've been discussing about evaluation and BATNA and costs and benefits and all that would be the appropriate time to, to me to do that. I agree. Um, I think that makes sense to me as well. I mean, it is also somewhat, in, if you look back at past practice, even with the current model, the board didn't, for example, vote on the specification for the total cost of care that we use. So I think it's consistent with our patterns and practices to date. Um, I did have a uh, question slash comment on one of the principles, but I can either hold that for next time or you know, I don't know if other people, if Jess or Tom want to weigh in on that first question, I can hold off. Tom, did you want to weigh in or? No, I'm, I'm all right with delegating. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I guess I will say that I'm okay with delegating, but the product that the draft that I see, I think require, you know, I, I, it is a work in progress and um, I'm hoping that it does, uh, <laughs> we continue on that. And I have, I jotted down some thoughts on principles and I, you put that slide up really fast and I'm not sure if all of my principles align or, or, or they're all there. Um, so I'm happy to just run through them quickly if that's helpful to you, Elena, Shule and team just quickly, does that make sense? That would be great. Yeah. Okay. And these are just like literally, I feel like this is not all inclusive. I just would say that these are just the ones that came top of mind, but, and, and maybe they don't all fall into principles, but these are things that are, you know, like I said, on top of mind, um, the model should bring in more federal dollars than the next best alternative. To me, that's the biggest principle that I think we have to make sure exists um, in the negotiations. Um, there has to be more flexibility with those dollars to be able to tailor it to Vermont's specific needs that we just heard all about, um, whether that's through waivers or other such, um, you know, mechanisms to tailor the dollars that are coming in to meet the needs that are very, very specific to Vermont. The transformation support has to be enough to cover or come close to covering the transformation that's going to be needed to guarantee or come close to guaranteeing the success of the model, as we've also heard some of the, you know, the necessary conditions for success. So the transformation dollars have to be uh, enough to really support that so that if we do this model, it's going to be successful or has a good chance of being successful. The inflationary adjustments, I do think, have to reflect the growth, the growth in the cost of care. So I have some concerns about the market basket, as we heard just from that panel. Um, the regulatory process in my mind, and that means an inclusive of CMMI, has to be nimble. So the CMS approvals for, say, the service line adjustments, they have to be timely. They can't be overly burdensome. So that has to be a nimble process in my mind. Um, it, it should strengthen primary care, long-term care, home health, you know, mental health, substance use. Those are issues that we are struggling with in Vermont right now. Um, so it, the, the principle is it must, you know, strengthen that more so than we could do in an alternative model. Um, ensuring greater and more equitable access to essential services and providing uh, a mechanism to promote efficiency, cost reductions, increased productivity and increased access. It should lower administrative burden um, to reduce burnout and lower costs. Um, balancing that with predictability, like it has to be flexible. Um, and we have to be able to learn from it so that, uh, you know, this is going to be a new model for the state. So there has to be some flexibility and learning on the part of, you know, the global budget methodology so that we can uh, evolve our process. But we have to balance that with the predictability. 
So those are all just like literally my sticky notes, but I, I will throw them all out there as, as thoughts that have come top of mind as we're going forward with this or if we're thinking about going forward with this. So Jess, I think I like to, I, you went through it quickly, but I liked a lot of what your, a lot of your thoughts. Some of them to me applied to the AHEAD model as a whole, or actually the AHEAD model plus the state regulatory model, which to me is really the whole, <laughs> the head model right. Medicare. There are other components that the state would do through its own regulatory authority, not the federal mm -hmm. regulatory authority. So I wonder if it would make sense to kind of take your thoughts and parse them into a head and where that's applicable versus like something that really applies to a payment methodology. Fair, that's fair. And again, I think sometimes I do conflate ahead and the global budget, you know, the global method methodology that we're submitting. It's it's to me, um, it's true that we should create buckets, but sometimes it's hard. To, no, no, totally. To Just a suggestion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fair enough, fair enough, yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to add in terms of the sort of along that same line is I feel like the last principle is putting a little bit too much on a Medicare methodology and not enough on the state regulatory authority. Because to me, when I think about this, I think about a, the AHEAD global payment methodology as a way to bring Medicare to the table with some Vermont specific tweaks to then fit in with our state regulatory model, which is where we would address high commercial insurance costs. So um, I may try to come up with just a way to massage that a little bit. I'd like, I think conceptually, I like where it's going, but I think it sort of minimizes the impact of, I think the state's role as opposed to the federal government's portion. Plus I also have to say, I feel pretty strongly about not ceding state authority to the federal government where it's not necessary um, because I don't think that does the state, quite frankly, any favors to your point around, you know, nimbleness of getting, you know, approval for things. If we don't need Medicare's approval for something, why would we ask for it, right? Um, so I just wanted to mention that I'll have a suggestion for Elena on the last one to try and tease that out a little more. Robin, can I ask a question about that? Because in some ways, um, if the dollars coming in under the global budget reflect the cost experience, medical cost experience of our hospitals and our providers um, more so than the Medicare market basket has in the past, that would reduce some of the pressure on commercial rate and commercial insurance costs. So could it be sure. tied to the inflation sure. that we use in our global budget to, to I, mitigate some of that? Well, I think there are a number of different ways that the methodology can bring additional dollars in. Um, but I think then the mechanism to address the high commercial rate is our regula state regulatory process. Like, I don't think the Medicare methodology in and of itself uh, like can impact the commercial process because it's, it's, you know, I, so I think to your point, I think if we can just massage it a little to reflect that, that, you know, the point is to try and ensure that Medicare is paying its fair share, so to speak. And then through our budget process, we know that the dynamics and the challenges we have there around commercial, like we have then the ability to potentially, uh, you know, reduce some of those high costs. So I, to me, it feels like it misses that middle step. That's all I, that, that was all I wanted to contribute. Okay, anything else? Great, we can uh, work uh, on this. We have a little bit more time to work. Oh, go ahead, Tom. I'd like to, I'd love to have a look at the revised principles. Um, we have a hard stop at 4.30 is when we're going to end. Um, is there any public comment? Uh, Sam, hey, how are you? Please go ahead. Hey, good. Uh, sorry, I'm off video. I'm just about to pick up my kid. A super brief comment. Um, 
just to consider adding as a principle a method for evaluation for the outcomes that I think are identified throughout this. Um, I, th I think that'd be important. Thanks. Yeah, no, good point. Elena, we should add that. I agree with that. Um, and Mr. Pice, for, we're, we're, we're kid friendly here at the CARE Board. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, any other public comment? Great. Any other new or old business for the board? And I will move to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Have a nice afternoon. We're adjourned. <laughs>